forces at the molars are nine times higher homology. and this was one of those patients who could probably damage a golf ball if you gave one to him uh, knowing that and, and I went through the consent process very carefully at the back of my mind I knew that the composite restorations that were going in the back team were not going to last as long as the front team but as I said, this approach gave me the opportunity to evaluate whether he could tolerate these changes. And in the least, putting this material across the, those surfaces helped to protect them. And this is pretty much what I found. If you look at the, the lower picture, within about two years, and the lower picture was taken in 2011, the composite started to wear. And this is what I had expected. But now, knowing that the patient can accept what I've done, and he's happy, he's able to chew without any problems, etc. I can use conventional crown restorations by simply cutting back the composites and using techniques such as a customized guidance table to copy the, that scheme into a crown restoration, which otherwise, if it's incorrect, can be very difficult to modify where you've cut back a lot of tooth tissue. And therefore, you know, the use of composite is not mutually exclusive. You may use it to trial out occlusal aesthetic changes and you may use these sorts of restorations uh, where you, you, you've kind of satisfied yourself uh, that the patient is able to uh, adapt to what you've done but the patient or you want something more durable there.
uh, without having to deal with the repairs needed for composite, and, and we'll discuss that uh, in a minute. So what's the evidence base? Now, up to now, I've spoken a lot about composite, and unfortunately, um, the evidence for the treatment, the restorative treatment of, of toothwear in terms of materials and techniques really relates to the use of direct resin composite. There are sporadic studies about using, you know, palatal veneers, etc., metal veneers, but most of the available evidence uh, relates to the use of composite. And the use of composite, and you, you've seen that, uh, obviously, I favor the approach, and it's what's uh, recommended in the consensus statement. It gives an, you know, an aesthetic option. It's minimally invasive, well tolerated, can use it diagnostically, so on and so forth. However, it does rely on a good level of operator skill and the presence of a good quantity and quality of enamel. So let's, let's have a, a glance at some of these studies. And there are about 15 of these studies published to date. And I've picked out a, a few because a majority of these studies are short term, sort of three year performance data with relatively small sample sizes. But I picked out a, a few which I thought were interesting. Study done by uh, Milosevic and Burnside. Sample had over a thousand restorations. It's an eight year prospective study and if memory serves correct, with an observation time of about three or four years, mean observation time. And they reported an overall failure of 7%. And, I, and, and, and just as a lay person, I would think 7% for thousand restorations Sounds pretty good. Study done by my colleague at King's, uh, David Bartlett, they looked at 251 restorations placed over a period of four years, which were monitored, I think, observed for a period of about 11 to 12 months. And they reported a good success rate of 83%, bearing in mind that short term. But signs of chipping or fracture were seen uh, in 63% of the patients included, with at least one or more uh, failure. And the message to take home here is the first study that the clinicians were experienced consultants. The second study treatment was provided by postgraduate students. And, and the, the, the message here is, or one of the things, two of the things that were highlighted is the importance of operator skill, especially with doing these uh, composite buildups, as well as the influence of the, of the etiology of, of the wear present. Study done by the Eastman Group, uh, Gulamali uh, and colleagues, uh, and I picked out this study because it's one uh, which is looking at uh, the, the DAL approach. Uh, and they had a sample of 283 restorations placed in super occlusion uh, with a 10 year follow up with a mean follow time of 5.8 years. And again, they found 90% signs of major and uh, minor failure, typically wear, marginal discoloration, so on and so forth. What was interesting uh, was the survival rate of replaced restorations was slightly lower. And, and the, 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 the thought was that this might be amongst those teeth where there's less enamel available and a greater reliance on dentine bonding. And we know despite advances with dentine bonding, enamel bonding is obviously gold standard and far more predictable. Uh, they also had some indirect restorations, indirect composites, and there wasn't that much difference. But what they did note was uh, high levels of success with class three incisor relationships compared to class one or class two div two. And that would be logical that if you look at class two div two, the composite buildups and the anterior teeth, those are likely to be exposed to quite high levels of tensile uh, shear strains. And that may account for sort of a, a higher failure rate. So looking at the occlusion beforehand is very, very, very important and again, you need to discuss these risks with your patients and how that can be managed. The fourth study, and I say this with an air of caution, uh, is, is in my opinion, the most relevant one, uh, not because I, I, I'm the author of it, but this was published a couple of months ago in the Journal of Dentistry, uh, and I've highlighted some bits of the abstract, which I think warrant some discussion. This study included the largest number of uh, direct restorations, direct composite restorations, over 1,269, with the longest observation period with any other study of 62.4 months, up to five and a half years. And what we found uh, is that the number of catastrophic failures where the, the restoration just couldn't be repaired was very small, only amongst 2.3 of the entire sample. The other failures were amenable to repair, where you could repair the composite by doing a bit of uh, revision bonding, 
or you know, a bit of polishing. And what we reported were overall annual failure rates of the anterior dentition of 2.2% per year and of the posterior restorations of 2.9% per year. Effectively, the posterior restorations are more likely to display um, signs of failure, but these are more likely to be of the variety where they can still be prepared to give service. And what we found, that the, the, the risks of failure at the molar teeth was twice as high at the premolars. That would make sense, given the, the higher levels of loading, as I discussed before. What we also found in, in a, in a follow-up study, and I haven't included this here, uh, which was also published in the Journal of Dentistry in, in July of this year, is that there's a significant association with how tall you make the restorations, how high you make them, with the survival. Essentially, the thicker, the taller you make them, the better they survive. And that would probably relate to the, um, the, 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 the increase in sort of uh, the compressional strength that you get with a material such as composite as you make it thicker. And the take home message is when you're going to put these, you do need to apply as much material as possible, respecting the sort of biological, aesthetic, functional parameters. Of course, you don't want restorations which look unsightly or with massive overhangs. But composite can offer a, a, a very, very good outcome if you've got good patients, uh, patient selection, and appropriate operator skill. And in this particular study, all five operators were skilled with adhesive dentistry protocols. So when you're looking uh, to prescribe these restorations to patients, uh, composite, you have to give your patients uh, a proper uh, 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 discussion that these materials do require a lot of maintenance, you know, debonding, chipping, fracture, wear and tear, discoloration will happen, and that's to be expected. And, and to try and help manage that, these patients will require routine monitoring and routine maintenance. And, you know, going back to the occlusion, one of the things that I focus on quite a bit is ensuring that that canine guidance stays in place, which helps to protect the other restorations. And I, I and I ensure that um, you know the patients are seen um, on, a, on a periodic basis. And you know if there's any early signs of where, especially those canines which are taking the bulk of the hits, that that's adequately managed. I haven't spoken much about crowns or ceramics, and to be honest with you, there's very little evidence available. There is a study which was uh, published by Milosevic. Uh, again, six, seven years ago, they looked at the performance of 161 zirconia crowns for the treatment of severe anterior tooth wear with a failure rate of 15.5% with a mean follow-up period of 72 months. Failures were largely due to D-bonds or minor delamination chips, so on and so forth. And there were some factors where there were high risks of uh, failure, such as edge-to-edge -edge relationships. But what we do know with crowns for the limited data that we have for wear studies is that crowns do perform better in the short to medium terms in terms of you know minor failures than composite does. However, when crowns fail, the failure is usually catastrophic. And that was shown in a study done by smells many years back. And when, when, when it's catastrophic, it's often the tooth has gone non-vital or the core is fractured, leaving you with a root stump. Essentially, the tooth has reached the end of the line. Now, we go back to the, where the lecture started. We're seeing more and more uh, wear and tear with younger patients. And we need to think very carefully about how we manage them, uh, especially with going in with highly invasive treatment protocols. We don't have, as I said, we don't have extensive data on the performance of crowns for tooth wear, but Taking a, a, a more sort of a global snapshot, um, the study done by uh, UK colleague Trevor Burke, uh, they looked at uh, restoration survival and, there were in the, and they, they, anal they looked at data for 3 million crowns placed on 1.2 million patients and 3 million resin composite restorations. Now, these are not exclusively on wear patients. They need to stress that. What they found was the time to next in the intervention were the crowns. 52% survived at 15 years, but with, with the fewest number of interventions, but when they failed, they failed badly. In, comp in contrast with composite, well, the, the survival rates were a lot less with the need for a lot more interventions, but 83% of those teeth stored with composite survived without the need for extraction. 
So in conclusion, when you see a patient with where it's really important to ensure you go through the processes, the prevention, the monitoring, and if you're going to restoratively manage these cases where possible, the emphasis would, would be to take a minimally invasive approach, uh, which gives you the opportunity uh, to make some adjustments, um, you know, to try and achieve the occlusal aesthetic endpoint, which the patient is satisfied with. And you can use uh, more durable materials once you reach that stage by using techniques to predictably copy those sort of occlusal aesthetic features using ceramics, using um, alloys, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's probably it from me. Uh, I thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, for your attention and, and, uh, and listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, Shamir. I'm aware that we're a little bit running over at the moment. So what I've asked is that people can the email Knightsbridge Academy with any questions for you and they will facilitate them if that's OK. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mustafa Kamal Yunsal next. Born in 1965, he had his whole education, including dentistry, in Ankara, Turkey. In October 94, he was been awarded his PhD with the topic of the clinical measurement of stress and strain induced in Branamark implant fixtures and abutments during the fitting of a cast beam and during application of simulated functional loads. He has been granted an associate professor in 1999 and a professor in 2005. He is still teaching and practicing as a part-time professor at the University of Ankara, Faculty of Dentistry, Department of Fixed and Removable Prosthetics. He also works in his private clinic in Ankara, Tur Turkey, where he is mainly concentrated on dental implants and metal-free ceramic treatment options. He has been involved with education and teaching organizations for the last 20 years of his career. He has been lecturing to dentists, dental technicians, and dental assistants frequently in an attempt to keep up to date with their professions. Professor Yunsal is an active member of the European Association for Osseo Integration, OSADA, and EDAD, which is the Turkish Association of Aesthetic Dentistry. Since June of 2012, he has been the founding president of TFI, which is Together for Implantology, a dental implant platform. His lecture is on tips and tricks that some of us don't know in fixed restoration impressions. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was a very nice introduction. I would like to thank uh, Knightsbridge Academy to uh, give me my, uh, this opportunity to be with you and with my colleagues again. Uh, I just want to ask as usual, can you see it or hear me? Any problems with it? We can see and hear everything. Thank you. Okay, this is a tips and tricks time. Now, uh, I know uh, dentistry is going a long way, but now what we have to do is to concentrate on what is the basic of dentistry. Now, I hope it was a nice one. <laughs> Our aim is to take an accurate impression. Now, uh, what we do, we, we take impressions all our, uh, in our life. Uh, you know, uh, dentistry needs to take the impressions. You can take it digitally now, but uh, the traditional impression taking has some rules and most of the uh, world is still doing traditional impression. So we have to know what we are looking for. Now, uh, doing an impression, uh, what we are looking is to take the impression of not, not the prepared tooth, but the neighboring tooth as well. And we are looking for a discrepancy of 50 microns. Now, uh, when we say 50 microns, it just say, well, 50 microns, but I want to uh, show it with some examples. Now, this is a ruler, a, a ruler uh, of European style, not a British ruler. And uh, each uh, space in between these black lines is one millimeter. And what we are opting is 50 microns. So what we say, the classical books say that you will make an impression and prepare a, and uh, produce a final uh, crown or bridge, and then you will have a discrepancy of 50 microns. Now, 50 microns is quite quite small. Now I can I can show it to you. It's the same uh, ruler. It's a little bit exaggerated in the next picture and you see the space between two black lines is 1,000 microns. 
and you are looking for 50 microns of uh, sensitivity. So if you don't understand it, let's put it in this way, a human hair is 50 to 70 microns. I mean, one human hair is 50 or 70 microns. And you are looking for, a, I mean, an acceptable gap of a hair. At the thickness of a hair is your acceptable uh, limit for a crown. So what, what can you, how can you do it? You need to take a good impression. That's the basics of it. Now, what are we uh, doing? We are talking about uh, everything, but we are not talking about the criteria for a perfect impression. What's it? Now, you have to do not only the prepared tooth, but its finishing line, borders, uh, and uh, the neighboring tooth has to be perfect in detail. You have to take a clear and detailed impression of the opposing jaw as well, because we are making a restoration which should not be high, uh, which should not be... Uh, out of occlusion. So you need a good impression of the uh, upper arc as well. And you don't need any voids or extra plaster uh, in your model. So what you have to do is the exact presentation of the mouth. Now, there are some proved uh, facts. Uh, these are all scientific. And let's go on, on them. 40 to 50% of the impressions are not satisfactory to produce acceptable restorations. I mean, we are making impressions all the time, but keep in mind that 50% of them actually are not acceptable to produce a 50 microns of fitting. So, uh, and this is proved with three different studies. And 13% of them, one tree, 13% of them is rejected as there was no possibility to work with them. Now, uh, that's a real problem because you spend some time, you spend some material, you spend some uh, money, and then the technician just calls you and says, well, I cannot work on this. So uh, impression has to be done. Now, saying, having said that, uh, I'm coming to some material aspects. Uh, I want to just go on the classification of fixed restoration impression materials. The first generation of them was polysul polysulfides, which we don't use it anymore. So I'm not using any, uh, spending any time on that. We are having C-type silicones, po silicones, polyethers, and uh, vinyl polysiloxanes, or in other words, uh, A-silicones. Now, let's start with C-type impression materials. Uh, some of the examples are here. I mean, these are the brands uh, that is used mainly. Uh, and uh, mo most of the time we are using, we are taking uh, impression with these type of materials, especially when the uh, cost of them is, uh, cost of them is important. Uh, we prefer C-type uh, silicones because they are cheaper than the others. Uh, they are obviously uh, much better than alginate impressions. Uh, however, they may lose their dimensional stability as short as 60 minutes. So you have a working time of uh, nearly four hours. Now, I said 60 minutes before, but 60 minutes is the uh, shortest time that you can use them. But in real life, you can use these impressions for four hours. I mean, you can pour the model uh, of following uh, the four hour that you take the impression. The main reason of this short working time is the uh, alcohol coming uh, evaporating from the materials body. Uh, and then we have polyethers. Polyethers are coming with different styles. I mean, not different styles, but uh, different uh, mixing styles. You can mix them by hand or you can mix them with uh, uh, impression guns and uh, special machines. Now, polyethers uh, only produced by uh, by 3M because they have the patent of this and they are uh, the only producer of polyethers. Now, there are some disadvantages with polyethers and advantages. I'll go through them and uh, we'll talk to, uh, about them together. Uh, they are difficult in hand mixing. Uh, and they are very rigid. So because of their rigidity, 
it's very difficult to take them, to remove them from the undercuts if you have a mouth with many undercuts. Uh, and you must be careful because these are not uh, always compatible with some synthetic uh, plasters. So the technician, if he is not used to work with that, may uh, use a synthetic plaster and then phone you and say, well, uh, Doc, I, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot remove the uh, plaster from the impression. So this is because some of the, uh, some of the uh, plaster materials are not compatible with polyethers. They are potentially allergenic and obviously they are expensive. But they have some huge advantages. They, ha they have high tear resistance, which they do not tear very easily. They are hydrophilic in their nature. Uh, their dimensional stability is the best of all the impression materials. Uh, because of this, you can use the same uh, impression to produce uh, more than one uh, set of models. And in a dark and uh, non-humid uh, environment, you can keep the uh, impression to another city. If your uh, laboratory is in another city, it's very suitable to, uh, to use polyethers. Different brands, I mean, all the impression, uh, impression companies, impression material companies produce uh, A-type silicones, and they are very handy. They come uh, with a global one, and uh, they have a putty. Uh, you use the flowable uh, silicone in the mouth, uh, and at the same time, your assistant prepares the uh, putty, and then you put it in the mouth and take the impression. It's quite easy, but they also have some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, not all of the brands show the same hydrophilic character. I mean, uh, A-type silicones are not hydrophilic in their nature. Uh, because of that, all companies put some other uh, chemical agents to make them uh, more hydrophilic. Uh, they are incompatible with latex gloves. If your uh, assistant is using some latex gloves, uh, she'll not be able to uh, mix it with the gloves. Dimensional stability is between C-type silicones and polyethers. They are hydrophobic in its nature, I have already told. But they have some advantages as well. High elasticity to resist tearing, good detail capturing, reasonable waiting time on the bench, and no toxicity or allergens. And now, uh, this was the uh, basics about the impression materials. But I want to tell something about the importance of tray adhesives. Uh, we do not think that they are important, but they are very important. Let's see. Tray adhesives are uh, chemical agents that we apply on the trays so that the impression material holds better in the tray. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to use different materials, different bonding agents for uh, every different uh, impression material. Polyethers has different uh, adhesives, alginate has a different one, uh, and uh, A-type silicone has a different one. Although there are some uh, universal bonding agents, uh, specific bonding agents are much better than the uh, universal ones. Now, why do you have to use it? We have to use it not just to retain the impression material, but to overcome the shrinkage of the impression material. If you apply the uh, bonding agent to the tray, then when the impression sets, it will not be able to contract. So uh, your impression will be safe and uh, correct. But if you don't apply it, there is a minimum uh, chance of contraction within the silicone. So if the silicone contracts, you will have a gap in between the tray and more than this, your impression may be a little bit, uh, how to say, uh, shrink. So you have to use impression uh, tray uh, adhesive. So let's look at the impression trays. Which tray should we use? There are many trays in the uh, market. 
this type of perforated trays like this one some plastic ones, some disposable ones, and the bite impression trays. Now, uh, I always prefer this type of uh, perforated tray with a rim on it. The rim is here because it just produces more retention to the impression material. Uh, however, I don't know the other side of the world, but in Turkey, we have uh, this kind of trays which I do not like very much because uh, they are not very standard in size. Uh, they have small holes and they don't have any rims around them. Okay, so the other question is whether to use a perforated tray or a closed tray. Uh, the purpose of perforation is threefold. Reducing the pressure during the impression, firm retention of the impression material, and uh, rims and, uh, and uh, to increase the retention of the impression material. So if you use this type of perforated tray, it will be much easier to retain the impression material on the tray. But um, the disadvantage of this, if you are using a um, flowable type impression material, it's very difficult to take it with them because it's because it's perforated and all the impression material will uh, flow from the perforations. So uh, therefore you have to choose a closed tray and in this case you have to use a, a tray adhesive with the uh, impression material. And there are some much more different uh, tray types, perforated ones, uh, small ones, only a partial one. Uh, I use all of them, but I use this uh, bite tray, especially the uh, semi uh, bite tray. Uh, I don't like them very much because uh, it's very easy uh, to deform the tray. And I will show you some examples with the uh, other slides. Now, uh, the main thing with the tray selection is your tray has to be uh, rigid that's factorly rigid because if the uh, tray is uh, not rigid your impression will change so you have to use a tray which is very rigid for your purpose so a flexible uh, mobile phone is good but a flexible uh, tray is not a good thing so how long do you need following the preparation for a good impression well, the main thing with taking the impression, uh, I mean, we are fighting with blood and circular flow because the circular flow and blood, which are both liquids, uh, they just uh, don't allow your impression material to get into the sulcus. So what you have to do is to stop bleeding or circular fluid flow uh, with the, uh, with, uh, prior to impression making. So uh, this, this question depends on how you work it. I mean, if you don't apply any special agents to stop bleeding, then you have to wait at least three minutes before making the impression so that the bleeding does stop. Uh, increased uh, washing of the mouth by the patient makes, it, makes, bleeding, uh, stop, makes bleeding more. So it's difficult to take the impression if your patient uh, washes his or her mouth uh, too much. Uh, just going on deep on that, I just want to talk about bite impressions and then I will talk about uh, circular fluid as well. Now, bite uh, impressions has a potential uh, hazard for uh, all of us because when you ask patients to bite something, they don't know what to do or what to expect. So they ju you just put the impression material in both uh, surfaces of the tray and ask the patient to bite it. But because the patient doesn't have any clue what to do, he just bites on it. And although he feels that uh, he's chewing the tray, he doesn't aware how, how important it is. So when you make an impression and if the patient uh, bites on the side of the tray, uh, the edge of the tray, the patient will realize it but uh, will not understand what it is 
So when you remove the impression, if you see that the patient has uh, bit the tray, then you have to repeat the impression because uh, this will always come to you as a, a high crown or high restoration. And also there's a tendency in people, if you put something in a, a, not in both sides, but in one side of the mouth, they tend to move their uh, jaw to, to that side. So you have to check it correctly. If you are using a semi-impression tray, you have to check uh, very, very uh, in, in, you have to check it uh, with caution so that he will not uh, bite in the in a position that he doesn't have to do. So when can you use uh, the segmented trays? I only use segmented trays if I'm doing a single crown restoration. If the restoration is more than a single crown, I always take the uh, impression of the full jaws, upper and lower together. Now, let's come back to soft tissue retraction. Now, we have some methods of soft tissue retraction. The first of them is to use a cautery machine or uh, use a laser to stop bleeding. The other one is to pack a cord uh, into the sulcus. And the third one, and uh, something uh, which is gaining popularity, is the uh, pastes that we can use to uh, extend the uh, sulcus. Sulcus. Now, when you pack the cords, uh, there's the likelihood that you can uh, damage the tissue. So what you have to do, uh, don't use the maximum thickness uh, cord. If, if it's a young patient without any periodontal problems, uh, the uh, tiniest uh, cord will be enough for you and you have to insert it with, with a uh, gentle pressure. Too much pressure will also damage the gum as well. And uh, there are special tools uh, for packing the cords. Uh, so you can use them and it will be enormous help for everyone. I like to use uh, pests uh, in the last five or six years. Uh, they are very handy, they stop bleeding as well and uh, they are much easier than using a, a retraction cord. So how to apply them? Uh, they have a very tiny tip. You have to insert the tip between the preparation and the gum, and you steadily press the uh, gum to uh, extend some material into the sulcus. Obviously, this is not enough. If you ask the patient to bite a cut and roll, on top of it, or you press it with your finger pressure, then when you wash and remove the paste, you will have a nice retraction all over and you will not have any bleeding at all. Now, there, obviously, there are some other bleeding management agents. Uh, most of them uh, contain ferric sulfate. Some aluminum preps and astringent are all in that category. Uh, what I don't like with ferric sulfate is uh, it's very, you know, uh, if you drew, put it on, on somewhere, it stains uh, everything. That's one uh, difficulty. The other one is when you put it in the mouth, it uh, stops bleeding, but the blood clot stays in place. And that blood clot uh, does not allow you to take a good impression. So uh, you just wash it but, uh, to remove it, to remove the clot. But when you wash it, then you start having a bleeding again. So uh, my preference in the last years is to use paste instead of some ferric sulfate or aluminum solutions. Uh, there are two types of retraction cords. One of them is braided, the other one is knitted. I prefer the knitted one because it's very easy to pack uh, into the sulcus than the braided one. This is a, a retraction cord of knitted one. You just see the knits between the uh, lines and then you just pack it very easily if you need it. 
uh, there's one method which is advocated by uh, many books, uh, but I'm not very, uh, personally, I'm not very successful on using that method, uh, although I will tell it to you. Now, uh, these suggest that you can put the uh, flowable impression material uh, around the sulcus and apply some uh, air pressure with the air syringe. Now, this method is uh, very logical, but when I tried to do it, I always ended up with uh, air bubbles within the sulcus. So I'm not using that. If I'm making a, a good retraction, uh, I just put the flowable impression material around the teeth. That's all. I don't uh, spray any air. Now, what's the ideal impression? What are we after? We are after a very good finishing line reproduction. So the impression material here representing a good impression because it just shows you your finishing line and then the uh, gap around it. So you, your technician can produce a very nice fitting crown on that impression. I just want to uh, see, uh, show you, share with you uh, how the problems uh, get on with our impressions. Now, if you see something like that, you know, the impression material is not uh, very complete on the edges. There are uh, six causes of it. Improper retraction, insufficient removal of blood or cervical fluid, insufficient drying, impression making close to polymerization. I mean, uh, you put the impression material, but it was just polymerizing, and then you just pressed it on the, uh, with the tray. So that produces something like this. Uh, your impression materials tear resistance may not be as good and the improper application uh, or too little silicone which is not enough to flow on the uh, are all the causes of this type of impression if you have air bubbles just as i said before uh, it may be because you uh, use the air syringe uh, you could have left some uh, blood or saliva here uh, you may be storing your silicone at a high temperature but you shouldn't put the uh, impression material in the fridge the impression materials all of them has to be stored at room temperature uh, and you may also put the tray uh, in a false position wrong position if you have a tearing at preparation margins you may have insufficient retraction, uh, bleeding stopper chemicals. Uh, some of them are not compatible with the silicone that you are using, and they just retard the setting of the uh, silicone. So uh, if you don't know this uh, and check the uh, setting time by touching the impression, the impression material around the tray will be set. And you say, well, it's set, I can remove it. But because of the... Uh, bleeding stopper agent, uh, your silicone within the sulcus is not polymerized. So you, you end up with such kind of uh, unsatisfactory impressions. Uh, you may have some temporary cement uh, remnants in the sulcus. Uh, you, have, you just remove the uh, tray too early. Uh, you, you may not be able to mix it properly or uh, your silicone may reach its expiry date. And if you see uh, impression tray visible within the uh, uh, impression, uh, it's the, the first uh, thing that you suspect is the improper tray selection. Uh, errors in tray positioning, too much pressure you exerted on the tray, uh, you may not be putting the constant pressure on the tray and uh, the impression material may be uh, less than what has to be there. And if you see flowable silicone lacking, then it means you, you didn't put 
uh, enough uh, silicone around the teeth. But the, mo the most of the time, the, the main problem is the putty that you are using is too hard. So when you press the putty, all the silicone material, I mean the flowable silicone, just runs out and uh, you are left out without a detailed impression of the solids. And if you have a lack of polymerization, it means you you couldn't uh, mix it properly and your expiry date may be ended as well. Uh, also, intraoral immediate temporary materials, uh, you know, we, we use immediate uh, impression material, uh, immediate uh, temporary materials uh, for tooth preparations and they have some kind of uh, oil, this GMA uh, in them. Uh, and if, if it stays on the tooth, then when you take the impression following the uh, temporary making, you'll end up with an uh, impression like this one. If you remove the tray early, and if you store your silicone in the fridge, you may end up with an uh, improper polymerization. Uh, removing the tray is also important. How to remove the tray? Uh, it has to, I mean, not all teeth are same. Uh, in some uh, patients, you have some teeth which is in awkward positions. So if you have a very angulated teeth, what you have to do is to remove the non-angulated side first and then remove the angulated side. Because if you do it other way around, then you will be forcing the impression material to leave the tray. And not only that, you will uh, also damage the impression uh, as well. So what you have to do to remove the uh, normal angulated side first and then the uh, too much angulated side. Uh, digital impressions are uh, another story. I'm not covering that in my uh, speech this time. Uh, and I would like all of you, thanking all of you for watching me. I can take any questions if you have any. Uh, I'm with you. I don't know if I have, uh, I'm okay with the time. but I'm waiting what you would suggest, Andrew. You can take some questions, that's fine. Yes. If anybody has any questions, they can put them in the Q&A on, the, um, on the Zoom meeting if they want. I think they have to put it on the chat, won't they? Yeah, okay, okay. Yes. or the chat. No, you must have answered everybody's questions, I think. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Always good. So thank you very much for your time. We have a, a little 10 minute break now until the next professor, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mustafa. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So 10 minutes until the next one, people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello Andrew, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you Dr. Chan. Okay, shall I, shall I start off now? Let's see whether I can see my screen now. Okay, can you see my screen now, Andrew? We can see your screen. Thank, Thank you very much. So I will introduce you. Yeah, I'm, okay. pleased, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Wyman Chan. Dr. Wyman Chan, BDS PhD, is a dedicated clinical teeth whitening and research dentist practicing in London. For over 20 years, he's worked with all major home and power whitening systems. His PhD in efficacy and safe teeth whitening processes led to seven UK and US patents. Dr. Wyman Chan has discovered the important ph phenomena in the texture of teeth and establishing protocols that have contributed to the movement in safety and efficacy of tooth whitening processes.
published important hypothesis whitening processes which help evaluate the texture of tooth enamel. Dr. Wyman Chan is well credited as the inve inventor of painless tooth whitening techniques and products. He was appointed as a clinic associate teacher at Warwick Dentistry, the University of Warwick from 2010 to 2016. He peer reviews for the British Dental Journal and has contributed to a book, The Art of Treatment Planning, Dental and Medical Approaches to the Face and Smile. That was Quintessence Publishing, October 2010. Dr. Wyman Chan's expertise in the field of teeth whitening in London is unparalleled, having treated over 16,000 cases in his London teeth whitening clinic and trained over 10,000 dentists from all over the world. Dr. Chan has appeared on BBC's The One Show, The Truth About Your Teeth, Fake Britain, Radio 5 Live and Sky Living. The lecture today is the important role of teeth whitening in aesthetic dentistry. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Good afternoon, um, everyone. I, I did, the time zone is uh, different. Um, yes, I'm, I'm really uh, honored and delighted to share uh, some of the insights of teeth whitening uh, with my uh, colleagues. Uh, I graduated from Guy's uh, in hospital many, many, many years ago, and I did my PhD at Bolton University, which is the efficacy and safety of teeth whitening processes. Uh, I think um, uh, um, they have been introduced. Uh, I have many more patents um, since uh, Andrew introduced. I have 14 uh, patents uh, been granted now. And uh, uh, as I said, I train all, um, many um, uh, dentists all over the world. Uh, um, I'm an inventor as well. Um, I'm the founder of Perfect Trace, which is an uh, amazing uh, bleaching trace and also white uh, teeth whitening uh, products. So in my own clinic, I only use my invention. So these are some of my inventions. And year 2002, that is um, a landmark uh, for me because that year I opened a dedicated teeth whitening clinic in uh, central London in the West End at Shaftesbury Avenue. Uh, at the same time, I decided to hang up my, my drills. So I stopped becoming a normal dentist 19 years ago. I just dedicated myself to do teeth whitening. That's what I do all day long, um, every day, apart from teeth whitening and in the clinic, I do research as well in the lab. So uh, to date, I've done over 20,000 teeth whitening uh, uh, procedures. I think today we talk about uh, aesthetic dentistry. Um, so how do we improve uh, the aesthetic of these teeth? Uh, this is a very, very typical uh, baseline color uh, where somebody never had any aesthetic treatment done uh, but before. The color of again, the canine is about B3. Uh, usually it's uh, many shades darker than the anterior teeth, than the centrals and, and the laterals. Uh, this is very, very normal. The canine teeth are usually uh, many shades uh, darker. Uh, I think we, we dentists uh, notice that all the time. And also that was the simple teeth, uh, those yellow teeth. How do we improve the aesthetic of these teeth uh, with severe fluorosis on the left side and severe tachycycline stains on, on the right side? So how, how do we um, make these teeth look nicer? But firstly, let's look at what is an ideal den den dentition. We always talk about an ideal um, uh, den uh, dentition. It got to be functional. It has to be able to eat and bite and, and, uh, and, and, and chew properly. It got to be healthy. The teeth got to be healthy. Not only, only the teeth, the surrounding tissues and the, and the supporting tissues got to be healthy as well. And uh, when we talk about aesthetic dentistry, uh, then we talk about they have they have to look nice and beautiful. They must aesthetically pleasing. This is an ideal uh, the, the dentition. But how many of us have this? Really, not not many. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the percentage is very, very low for uh, anyone that have an ideal uh, dentition. Okay, so and that's why we do elective aesthetic uh, dentistry to make the teeth look um, uh, better without uh, compromising the health of the, uh, the, of the teeth and the surrounding tissues and also without compromising the functional effect of the uh, capability of the teeth as well. So what are, what are the treatment they are? Um, we, so we got to align the teeth if they are not straight, if they are uh, crowded. So the most common is uh, align the teeth. And also we change tooth uh, or the teeth shape. Uh, if it do not look good, uh, we change the shape as well. This is the uh, aesthetic dentistry. Also we change the color as well. If the color is not bright enough or not, uh, not, not too white, and then we change the color. This is the traditional uh, aesthetic 
uh, cosmetic uh, dentistry. That's what we uh, we do. So, one of the methods of uh, achieving alignment, uh, align the teeth and uh, change the shape of the teeth and also change the color. So we have in a tools, uh, we have a lot of things we can do. Uh, we can do a restorative, restorative um, uh, dentistry. So we can align the teeth uh, well, with, uh, restor uh, with uh, restorative, uh, we can do all three. You can align the teeth better if you are not too crowded. You can change the shape of the tooth as well, and then you can change the shade as well. And what, what do we do with that? So with a minimal invasive technique, uh, we can use composite uh, uh, veneer. So provided uh, uh, we do not compromise the health of the surrounding uh, tissue, I think this looks pretty good. We can use uh, porcelain uh, veneers as well, uh, minimal invasive, or we can go for the more invasive technique, uh, which are porcelain crowns. Uh, this uh, the crown here looks really nice. And uh, what other method can we do to um, do aesthetic uh, dentistry? We can use orthodontic um, uh, method, but orthodontic is limited. We we'll, we can align teeth. We can change the shape of the tooth by uh, uh, by intruding and then extruding the teeth. We can change the shape of the teeth. But with orthodontic treatments, we can change change the color of the teeth. Uh, yes, some of the colors may become like white white patches, but that was not intentional. So basically, we can do two out of three. And chemically as well, we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, change the teeth, make it look nicer chemically. Uh, chemical means. What do we mean by that? We can do teeth whitening. Teeth whitening is limited as well. Only can change the shade of the teeth. We can make the teeth brighter, whiter, but we cannot align the teeth. If they are crowded, we cannot change change that. We cannot align the teeth. If the, if the tooth shape is not an ideal shape, what a, what a good shape we want to change, we cannot change that as well. So teeth whitening is only limited to changing the color of the teeth. So what is teeth whitening? Teeth whitening represents a bleaching process that removes stains and enamel in the dentin, uh, in the enamel and dentin of the teeth. So the active ingredients of uh, is hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide, which is commonly used by the dental uh, profession. So and there are many ways of doing teeth whitening. These are the, uh, these are the most uh, popular ways, and many many other ways. Uh, we have in office bleaching, uh, you have home bleaching or whitening, you have internal bleaching. And you can do the combination of the above three uh, uh, together. You can do it in any sequence you want. So there are many, many, many ways of doing teeth whitening. I think a lot of you probably have done teeth whitening. Many of you may be very, very experienced. I think if you do some uh, teeth whitening or you've been doing using it a certain way, if it works in your hand, uh, I advise you to do not change. Stick to something that really works. But uh, if you think that... Um, uh, uh, you're not happy with the results you have, you think that you want to, you want to uh, do better, you can always uh, consult me. I'm more than happy about your help. And hopefully uh, you can learn a lot from uh, this uh, uh, webinar. So what is in-office bleaching? In-office uh, bleaching, in fact, is something we do in a clinic. Uh, normally, we're using a more con concentrated gel, peroxide gel. Uh, you can buy up to 40% um, hydrogen peroxide. Within, our, within the profession. But if you are from, from the EU, we are limited to only up to 6%. It doesn't matter what we use. And it depends on the system you use as well. Some system they uh, use um, uh, isolation dam and some do not. It depends on what you use. If a concentration is very high, obviously they will use something to protect the gums. Uh, uh, if the concentration is low, like in the UK, only 6%, maybe we don't, we don't bother because it's so weak. And there are also many different types of uh, teeth whitening uh, devices. Uh, let's, this, this is a good time to go back to uh, that. I think history is, is important. We would look at how uh, in-office whitening was started. In fact, it was started many, many years ago, over 100 years ago. But when it became become, uh, modernized, when it became using a machine, that is when it, in the 70s, a company called Union Broach in the US actually invite, invented um, a bleaching of, uh, of a device. They are using heat. Uh, so, in those days, the first really, really uh, advanced machine in those days are using heat and they are using hydrogen peroxide gel uh, liquid. In those days, it's not gel as well. And then we move on to 1997. That's when I got excited about uh, teeth whitening because I was introduced to Creative using a plasma um, light. 
is, is a curing light. You can use that as a curing light as well, as well as a bleaching light. So really um, excited and uh, we're one of the uh, pioneer um, um, uh, dentists who started uh, this. I got even more excited in 1999 when this happened. Bright Smile actually brought in the first bleaching lamp. I think this is an amazing invention. This is the first time we dentists do not have to put our fingers into the patient's mouth and then we can make a living. Then we would paint a gel, we put a machine and the machine is three times 20 minutes initially. So we say an hour, we don't have to do anything and we get income. I thought this is an amazing. I got really excited about this technology in those days and started researching into this and doing a lot. Uh, and then um, this is my invention in 2007. I actually went back to heat from heat to plasma to laser, blue light. I went back to heat. All these are um, uh, heating uh, devices. This is the high power, the, the Y10, and this is the, my latest, uh, Dr. Wamin Chan. Um, uh, we, we call it the Get to Smile uh, device. Professional home whitening, it all started in 1989 when um, Haywood Heyman published a night guard vital uh, uh, bleaching at the Contenson in March 1989. This is when uh, everybody got excited about uh, teeth whitening because this is the first time we have proved that uh, carbon peroxide, they're using 10% carbon peroxide in a, in a mouth guard and then actually uh, make the teeth. Uh, or whiter. But before that, in 1968, an odontologist by the name of Krusmia already doing it, and it's been lecturing and it's a study clubs. And that was until two years later that Hayward and Heyman uh, and, and, and knew about this, and then they actually went, went about and proved that the tempers and carbon monoxide actually uh, do whiten teeth and does whiten teeth. And most dentists think that teeth whitening is very similar, very simple. I used to think the same in the, in, in the 1990s when I started doing home whitening. I thought it was quite uh, simple, really simple. What I had to do is uh, take a set of alternate impressions, uh, send to the lab, get my bleaching trace done and get my patient some gel and keep my finger crossed, get my fingers crossed and hopefully the teeth will go white. That's, that's, that's what we used to do. Um, I'm sure lots of uh, us do, do the same thing. And uh, the home whitening, that's, that's, what, that's what it is. Let's use some peroxide gel with some uh, bleaching, bleaching trays. There are so many different systems in the market. And in office, what is an office? Uh, so dentist thing is very simple as well. It's the use of peroxide gel, but this time it depends on the concentration that we use. If we use very high concentration, like uh, the commonly used um, in international, is about 35% hydrogen peroxide, and that is very caustic. Uh, we should use protection to protect uh, the gums. Um, and dentists say that it looks very similar. All, all the systems look very, very, very similar. So what are the in indications of teeth whitening treatment? As long as the teeth are natural teeth will work. It doesn't matter what they are. Uh, it doesn't work on uh, artificial teeth like crowns, veneers, dentures, they don't work. And fillings, they don't work. So let's look at the problems and risks uh, associated with teeth whitening. I think the most common we see is inconsist inconsistent and unpredictable result that yes, we do teeth whitening, we always keep our finger crossed and, and just hope, hope for the best that, uh, that uh, will produce result for us and uh, the patient's happy and then uh, we feel comfortable. The second problem is the result. Yeah, we, we do have results. Um, I'm talking about especially in the in-office uh, 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 whitening. Um, yes, we have result. At least 80-90%, we, we see very good, not just result, very good results. The problem is that they don't they don't last long, they fade back rapidly. That is a problem. That result, but did not last long. And also we have problem with uh, sensitivity as well and pain. So that's why many, many uh, systems, many systems, they actually uh, they, they advocate the use of energy energy sex or desensitizing agents before or after treatment. So uh, ibuprofen is very uh, common. Uh, I used to use that uh, when I was uh, started doing teeth whitening over 20 years ago. I was an experience, but now I hardly use any of this product. Yes, I used to use, um, what's the same, nitrate as well. I put it in the whitening trays if I have sensitivity. But now the more experienced you are, and then you don't have to use this kind of uh, 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 um, materials anymore when they become really experienced. But when you're not experienced, I think it's helpful so that your patient will feel comfortable. 
uh, the loss of shininess on the teeth uh, by surface, and this happens, uh, especially when you do in office whitening as well. And also, I think I think the fifth one is um, it's very troublesome. Damage to the gingival and or soft uh, tissue. Now, this is actually published 13 years ago in an Australian dental uh, practice and in a journal. The use of the 35% hydrogen peroxide in, in office, they found that uh, this is what is regret. The white area on the gingival are caused by the irritant effect of radicals from the bleaching gel that have leaked onto the tissues during the procedure. I will raise my hand up. This happened to me before, not once, many times when I was inexperienced because the dam wasn't put on properly, wasn't stuck on properly. It can, it, it can happen. If you're not experienced, it can happen. So then that's why uh, this dentist are uh, very modest and actually put it in the article and warn uh, uh, the fellow um, professionals that this can happen and please be more careful and do the protection the isolation better. So, so I'm sure that happened to everyone, whoever has done in office, it mustn't happen to everyone. If it happens to me, it can happen to anyone. Um, but this is more severe. Uh, when it's not done properly, you've got a very severe burn. This is the loss of tissue. Uh, obviously, this hasn't happened to me, but it is very serious. Also using 35% hydrogen peroxide. And um, this is at the exhibition. I see that all, all the time. I go around the world and people using 40% hydrogen peroxide. I think the protection is not enough and, uh, and the lips got burned. So it's very common you see this. You see, if this can happen to a teacher who is doing a demonstration at the exhibition, supposed to be a very experienced dentist, and what hope is there for the rest of us? So it can happen. So don't, so don't feel so sorry if this happened. Um, but we can prevent all this. I want to show you is preventable or can be prevented. And uh, fortunately, this wasn't done by a dentist. They actually were done in Scotland, in the UK. Uh, and, uh, this happened actually in the um, hairdresser, a hairdresser doing teeth whitening. It was very popular in the UK. Lots of non-dentists were doing teeth whitening and using very high concentration, using 35% hydrogen peroxide. And the patient actually done by her friend, a hairdresser, and she posted onto the website and ask people to not go to the non-dental or professional. What happened is that the gel leaked to the soft tissues and the lips uh, got inflamed and that's why the lips become so swollen. This is 24 hours after. So if it, all this can be prevented, all this, all I want to show you, all can be prevented, all this now, uh, if you do it carefully and uh, uh, do the uh, do your SOP properly, all this can be uh, prevented. And many of my colleagues ask me, what method do you like to do? I, I like to do combinations. I like to do in-office and then I like to do home bleaching. Sometimes I do in-office first, followed by home bleaching. And sometimes I do the home bleaching, followed by in-office and followed by home bleaching. So there are different ways of doing teeth whitening. I think what works in your hand is most important. If you get good results from certain method, just continue with it. Unless you think that some other method can get you a better result, then you always can try. You always can try. There's so many different ways of doing teeth whitening. The standard operating uh, procedure, just go through what I do when I do teeth whitening. Photos are very important. I normally take four uh, photos. What I do, I take a photo uh, using a, a shade guide, which is the, the Vita classical uh, uh, classical guide uh, um, and the um, from the uh, B1 to the C4. Uh, so, so this is, I usually put a tag opposite the uh, uh, centrals. So this is as a guide. I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not doing uh, a shade taking here. This is only a guide of the color. Uh, I realized after I've done so many cases that 80% of the, of the, uh, of, of, of the centrals are usually a2 if they haven't had any 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 aesthetic work done uh, done before and 95 percent is full within a1 and a3 if you use a2 you can't be follow we're not taking shape we just we just have a have a guide just uh, so that we know what color they are and in and the uh, laterals uh, and the uh, canine 80 percent is a3.5 before so you can't uh, go wrong and then it's about 95 percent between a3 to a4 if you use this shade guide from a1 a2 a3 a3.5 a4 you can't go wrong so at least we we will see a guide that give us the uh, uh what kind of color they are and and how close they are to a3.5 and how close they are 
to A2 because tooth has is no tooth is A2 color. So our know, teeth have many, many colors. And then I take a, a, a full mouth with all the gums I want to see just in case the patient uh, complained that, oh, you damaged my gum. At least you have that before for the rub to show that, no, I haven't because your gums are exactly the same as I did it before. And then I always take a portrait as well so I can see before and after. Okay, um, in my clinic, um, I work two days in my clinic now. I, 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 I cut down a lot. I used to use, uh, was used to work uh, three days, so three and a half. Um, when to come to my clinic, I don't, I don't just do teeth whitening. Um, I do aesthetic and dentistry. So I, I ask my patient to choose the color. I give them a shade guy. Normally I give them up to B1, uh, a, a normal uh, Vita classical uh, shade guide. If they say the B1, do you then then yes. And some people um uh, they want the teeth to go really white. They ask, do you have anything whiter? Only then I take the OM one two three out. But but normally most people are quite happy with B1. But at my clinic, um, ninety five percent of my patients they go they want whiter than B1. So from a B1 from from a data I have the big data the twenty thousand uh, cases that I've done from from B4 to uh, B1 uh, is is is. It's not difficult. Uh, if you use the right technique, use the right products, you can get it usually between two to four weeks. Yeah, it's quite predictable. Um, so I always show them when you want a B1. So I take a B1 out from a shade tag and put it next to the B4. At least a patient can see the contrast between the B4 and B1. If it's B4 and then B1 is so far away, they have to look here and then look over here. And they find it difficult to comprehend how wide the teeth have gone to. So we've got to put them side by side. Then they can see really, really clearly. Okay, so how do we improve the aesthetic of these teeth? This patient come in um, quite young, uh, it's only uh, 21. And uh, she say she only wants to whiten her teeth. She's not considered any, I'm not worried about the, um, uh, the, 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 the mouth crowding, not worried about that at all. Only she doesn't like about the color, especially the canine. She says it's too dark when she takes photographs nowadays, the social media days, they show up with a, a good lighting. So do you, uh, uh, she doesn't like all this color. Now, in old days, not that bad, but nowadays it show. A lot of my patients come in because they do a lot of selfies, they do a lot of videos, and they, they could see their teeth uh, are yellow. So how do we do? We just uh, do two weeks teeth whitening, and I think the result is pretty good. So from A1, uh, B2, we're going to OM2, and then from B3, you go to OM2, and uh, and then uh, and, and then uh, was the worst one is OM3, so I think it's pretty good. Um, and then uh, we've used the, this is the crystal art, right? the stack of photometer, which you can tell me how many shades the teeth gone white, have gone 18 shades white. And we can do from here, we can see the full mouth. This is that's why I always take a photo here with a B3, and then I'll always take after photograph with the same shade tag so that the patient can see the contrast i know this gone to om2 om3 if you put an om2 om3 the two photos they really do not look that impressive if you put a b3 next to the white and teeth they look really really impressive so how do we improve the aesthetic of this is um uh, joe uh, joe is very young when he came to see me in 2010 only 15 years old and uh, and the mom came with her mom and says that i just want just want to, uh, Joe is not happy with uh, the color of his teeth. It's want to improve. So uh, same, we did two weeks as well. I think the, the color was also amazing. Uh, from B3, also gone to OM3, OM2. I think the color, uh, we can produce this kind of result day in, day out. And it's uh, 18, 19, uh, about 18 shades, uh, about whiter. Before and after the concert. So people say that oh, it's a different color. Yes, because the setting is different is another time. But the most important is the contrast. People can see the contrast of that. So that is very close to B3, but that is so much wider than B3. And a 19 year old uh, did it uh, two years ago. It's really good, came in with an A2 color. When we finished, we've gone to an OM2, also 15, 16 shade whiter. And or this is uh, his sister. Uh, we did the uh, stuff with A2 as well. And then uh, when we finish, uh, it's gone nearly about OM1. So many, many shades whiter, 13, 14 shades whiter. So only two weeks. How do we uh, also input the aesthetic of these teeth? Yeah, we can see slight 
crowding uh, Tom. Tom said that uh, he only wants his team or whiten. Uh, hasn't got money to uh, do the rest of the work to align the teeth, orthodontic treatment, all that. Uh, hasn't got enough money. So just want to uh, do the first step, just have the teeth whiten first. And then our farmers so first back to photometers, we can uh, analyze the teeth. We saw that the canine is A2 and the, uh, the, um, the centrals and the laterals A1. So we just did um, one treatment, which is two weeks. Um, and then it's pretty, pretty good result. From A2, gone to OM3. From A1, gone to OM2, OM3. And the color is just nice, nice and even, really nice and even, if you notice that. Um, two weeks, I think there's a very good result. And uh, Tom is uh, very happy uh, to show off his new smile. Emma, we did it in 2013. Uh, also, just one the teeth whitening done. So we also did two weeks. Uh, we done, we done hundreds of top, if not thousands of these uh, cases just to show you okay those are really easy the yellow teeth are really easy now look at some difficult cases um, i'm very proud to uh, show off some of the uh, cases by my students uh, which is this is dr chen from uh, china and wenzhou uh, and um and she's a qualified we said a certified uh, Dr. Wang and Chen, uh, a dentist. I do a lot of training in China, spend a lot of time there now. And this is a very interesting case. And this patient, Mr. Yu, 68 years old, and uh, only don't know why he started to uh, look, uh, care about the aesthetic of his tooth. And he told uh, Dr. Chen that he had this tooth for 40 years now, since Ruthfield had an accident, uh, Ruthfield trauma, and uh, just uh, lived with that tooth for 40 years. So maybe he decided that uh, he wanted to make a tooth whiter, say so he wished to change the tooth color to match the rest of the adjacent teeth. And that tooth can see C4 is so much darker than C4, so much grayer than C4. And um, I actually help uh, Dr. Zen. Uh, I, I do a lot of treatment planning now for, for dentists in China. That's what I do. We, we provide treatment planning, like in this line. That's what I do now. We're like in this line. Uh, the dentist send us photos and send out a lot of work x rays. And then from then, I ask them to do a few other uh, work, some other work, and uh, to analyze the teeth so I can give them a very precise treatment plan and to the color that they want. So this is only um, traditional treatment. Uh, this is uh, of choice is internal uh, internal bleaching uh, what is internal bleaching just quickly go in there we we'll open a hole from from the uh, palatal side because that has got a composite filling and then uh, we remove the, the, the gp points uh, refill all the way down a few meters three millimeters below the uh, uh, uh the, the the bone of the crest level and then we fill up with gi and then we put um we put a um, pardon for oxides or sodium perborate or whatever you have in your hand and then we seal the cavity. Also keep our finger crossed and hopefully the teeth will go white. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, this is a, a treatment of choice. But we decided not to do that because I haven't done internal bleaching for at least 10 years, nine years now. The last time I did probably about 2012. So we do uh, we do a non-invasive, we don't, we, do, we don't even drill. So, so I advise her, I say, let's try this method because it worked really well. Uh, with me. So we're using a customized phrase. And this is only two weeks. Review the patient. I was quite shocked. I didn't I didn't realize it worked so well. And because the patient only treated one tooth and then when we put on onto the onto a mixing pad, uh, uh, there's some excessive gel so the patient put a little bit next to next door and then put a little bit on the canine. And this teeth got whiter as well. So I thought this is amazing, amazing result in two weeks with excess external bleaching. No internal bleaching. No walking bleach, no inside, outside. There are so many ways that uh, the, the tra traditional way of doing it. This is purely non-invasive external bleaching with tray, with perfect tray. Okay, let's look at uh, another interesting case: a traumatized tooth, a sound tooth. So, what would you do if the tooth is not refilled? You see that you can see it's still sick and down. Uh, what are the treatment plan for um, Olivia? Uh, Olivia came to us when she was 18, uh, uh, presented herself with a discolored tooth. She said she uh, knocked a tooth uh, 10 years ago when she was 8 years old and bumped bump into a wall and only realized this about a year ago, the teeth started to get discolored, getting more and more discolored. 
traditionally, we can do porcelain veneer on one tooth. If the patient just want one tooth to be uh, treated, or you can do a um, porcelain crown just on one tooth. Depends on uh, what you like to do. But in this case, uh, I offer a non. Um, um, well, also, uh, traditionally, we also can do internal. Uh, bleaching. I've seen this. I actually seen this in articles that uh, uh, some of my colleagues uh, they uh, open up a hole, do a root filling, and do internal, internal bleaching, and the result is very good. They actually match it to the color of the tooth next door. Uh, it's very good. But Olivia says she not only wants the tooth to match that, she wants the rest of the teeth to go white, including that and including including the front teeth to go to go white as well. So to do that, so we offer her teeth whitening. So just three weeks. Uh, we have a system called Get Your Smile, which is a paint on surface system. You, we use that. This is an amazing result we have. Just three weeks. Look at the dates: 16th of February and uh, 9th of March, 2010. Um, from A1, we'll go to OM2. From a B4, we'll go to OM3. The K9 is B4. We'll go on to OM3. I thought that was amazing, amazing result. And non-invasive. We don't have to drill a hole. Don't have to drill a root filling and do not have to put a restorative and palatally on that too, or non-invasive from here to here. I thought that is amazing. And we got it about a 17, 18, 18 shade whiter. And I say it's very happy, Olivia. How about fluorosis? Um, it depends which area you come from. If okay, you come from an area the water not uh, uh, treated, uh, you have fluorosis, for example, here. This is um, mo moderate, it's not severe. So the patient is not happy about the uneven shade uh, with white uh, patches uh, because he's getting uh, married. I want to take some nice photographs in, in uh, Bali in Indonesia uh, so that I um, want to have the teeth whitened so that he can smile. Now he doesn't like to smile because of the color of the teeth. So there are many different ways that traditionally yeah, a lot of dentists would have done or would do microabrasion. So what is micro, what is microabrasion? Microabrasion, for example, is like that. Then we use strong acid. Uh, tradi traditionally, we use 18% hydrochloric acid. And nowadays, we use 35% phosphoric acid with a bit of a pumice, make it into a paste. Um, and then you use use a slow hand piece. You use a brush and you brush it in. And you can, you can easily remove even 10% of the enamel if you're not careful. So this technique is very abrasive. So we've got to explain to our patient, microabrasion, enamel microabrasion actually is taking a layer, taking layers of enamel away. And it could be 10% of the enamel, can be a lot. So this is something we need to uh, tell our patient that microabrasion is taking enamel away. It's just like putting a burr on, on here and just drill away. I think I think that's faster using a burr rather than using this method. I do, but I do, I uh, should uh, do that. Okay, you can use microabrasion with this uh, technique, but uh, David said doesn't like to lose any enamel because uh, I've been waited for so long. I want something uh, different. How about resin infiltration? Resin infiltration, that means we fill up, we apply resin in this area, and then how do we change color? It's by the alteration of the reflective index because this area um, must be more, more porous than the normal. That's why they look uh, the white patches here. So the resin infiltrate into this area and then just change the refractive index similar to the rest of the teeth based on the color looks similar. But this is making teeth yellower, not whiter. So David said, oh, I want to make a teeth whiter. I don't want my teeth to look yellower. My white patches become yellow. So that's another option that David uh, rejected. So I say now we have two other methods left. We, we can do porcelain veneers or can do non-invasive teeth or whitening. And obviously, David has um, been waited for so long, 38 years. So he said, I want to do the non-invasive invasive way. Let's uh, give it a go. So four weeks, we did that. I was really shocked when I saw David uh, back in then, I think 2013. Not only, not only the white face is nice and even, I saw that there's a, quite a lot of remineralization as well. All these the white patches disappear. So beautiful. So if you've got a system that can make a teeth white and also do some remineralization, isn't that wonderful? And uh, David is very proudly showing off uh, his new smile. Angel, 30 years old, uh, quite severe. The frozen, you can see a lot of uh, uh, white patches there, very, very opaque. And then you've got very dark brown color there. And then you can see a lot of pits as well, uh, enamel. 
actually uh, quite lots of um, uh, lesions there. Same we can offer, uh, I'll offer Angel the four, the four standard treatment, microabrasion, res resin infiltration, post and veneer, she rejected four of them, and she said she wanted a non-invasive treatment, which is a teeth whitening. So we did that four weeks as well. Uh, I thought that's a pretty good result, but I'm not happy with the result, but I told her that we need about four to 12 weeks to make it really beautiful. But Andrew says she's so happy with her teeth that I could not ask her to spend more money to have uh, more treatment. I think this looked pretty good, but it gives it a bit more time. This can look even more, even look even more amazing. But Andrew was so happy uh, with the treatment. You can see that all those not that obvious anymore. It's a lot of remineralization going on as well. Okay, let's look at Texas Cyclin stain tea. This is very, 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 very as a, a, a severe, very, uh, very, uh, how would say, a lot of this in the, in, in the Far East because uh, the Asians, especially the, uh, the the Orientals, the Chinese, and uh, they like to take medications. So that's why they took a lot of medication. This is a uh, 58 years old. Um, um, Patrick came to see me with moderate tetracycline stain teeth um, from Hong Kong. Same thing of offer, offer porcelain veneers. This is what, uh, what, we, what we could do for a patient. We could do veneer, we can do crowns, we can do non-invasive teeth uh, whitening. And Patrick said, I've been waited for so long. Uh, I, I, didn't know, I just didn't want to. I want to see a dentist. So I want to improve the aesthetic. The only hope is we have to do veneers or crowns. So he actually bumped me to me in the exhibition in China. Um, so, and then he started asking me about whether I can do anything about his teeth. And then I said, yes, you come to London and see me. And then uh, I, will, I will do something. And then uh, six weeks uh, later, he came, actually came over to see me uh, all the way from Hong Kong. And I'm very happy. So six weeks, we make the teeth from a D3 to uh, OM3. And now he's showing off his smile. Now he's keep topping up his teeth is OM1, OM1 now, much wider than OM3. He top up every six months now. How about severe Texas cycling stain teeth like this? This is this is a very, very nice uh, story I'd like to share, uh, share with you. Thomas, 39 years old, uh, Caucasian. Um, one Friday, he went to a party. And uh, in a party, he bumped into a, bumped into a dentist. And then, you know, we are dentists, we, we go to a party, anyone know that we are dentists, they will come around and ask for free advice, always. And uh, Thomas, exactly the same. Went up and said, the dentist, well, he, he, he was a dentist, uh, he's a dentist, and say, oh, I've just been to Harley Street that afternoon. Uh, and then I'm going to have my teeth veneered because I've got this Texas Cycling stained teeth now. I'm, I can afford it. I just want to look good. And they even contour the teeth for me so that I didn't make a shape for me that was slightly small. And then um, I, I don't have a name of this uh, dentist, but this dentist probably been to my course, my seminar. And he told Thomas that before you have the teeth grind down and veneered, he said, you should go and uh, see Dr. Dr. Wyman Chan. Maybe he have other options for you. So. So Tom uh, called in uh, Monday and uh, make an appointment and very curious coming in and say, what can you do for me, Dr. Chen? Say, everybody say only veneers or crowns can uh, improve the aesthetic of my teeth. I say that we have a third option. We can do non-invasive teeth whitening, but it, 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 it would take a while. As a veneer crown, maybe one or two weeks, your teeth will go white, but uh, uh, need some uh, uh, since some grinding of the teeth, maybe a little bit invasive, could, could be minimal, could be more invasive, but depending uh, on whether it's veneers or crowns. So Thomas said, that, are you serious? You mean you can make my teeth look better without grinding them down? I said, yes, I can, I could. So we started the treatment. I offer him a 12, month, uh, 12 weeks, a three months uh, a regime. So the teeth are pretty dark, C4, A4, C4, A4, you can see that. And um, baseline, and nine weeks later, we got pretty, pretty good results. And then uh, 12 weeks later, we got very good results. I say, oh, we, we could go go on. And then uh, I asked my colleague uh, to uh, to file down the, uh, the composite filling being put here because otherwise it will affect my treatment. So, and then um, I asked um, Tom to go to find a dentist and then I uh, just have the contouring done there because that is maybe too thin, it may break. So Tom is very happy. 
Okay, and uh, not only I can make uh, Turkish second in teeth white. This is uh, one of my students, Dr. Gao, um, in, in Beijing. Um, he's done many, many cases. He's done dozens of cases now. This is one of his uh, 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 very first one, first Texas Texas cycling cases. I'll show you now. He he he's, he worked so much better. Just so I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the, of the students that I taught in China. And um, Miss Kong, uh, 35 years old, um, prefer a non-invasive solution of a smile. So Dr. Gao, uh, I, I tried to guide the team. I gave him a treatment plan. I say I gave him a, a four months treatment plan, but he did all this in three, in three months. So I think that was really, really impressive. Um, another certified uh, uh, dentist, uh, Dr. Ouyang. Uh, who's, who's a PhD in uh, an orthodontist, uh, or orthodontist uh, got a PhD, uh, work uh, in a private clinic there, pretty small dental in Beijing. And uh, we were working together and um, they do a lot of fixed uh, braces. She, she doesn't, she does a lot of this line, but her her, her, her colleagues, uh, then, uh, then um, uh, two other orthodontists there, they do many fixed. And this is what they discover. After they done um, the fixed braces, they found that for the, the teeth demineralized. That's what they realized. They asked me, can we do anything about this? I said, yes, I've been looking into this. I've been doing some work on this as well. Um, I say, why don't you give it a go and, and, and say, see whether we can change uh, the color and make it more, e more even. The patient's just not happy about the unevenness. The teeth are nice and straight, but they are not slightly because of the white patches. Uh, started when she was 19 years old and then uh, and then uh, two years fixed uh, braces. So she did just 10 days, just trace, just trace with the uh, with uh, with the products, uh, with the TY Tlingma products. And when she showed it to me, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was shocked. So, I mean, we can do things like this now. So the scope is, is enormous now what we can do with uh, hydrogen peroxide. So this is an amazing result. Only ten days. Imagine if we do two weeks, two months. What 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 is what the result can lead to? Okay, and many people say, how long can it last? It can last a long, long time. I think it lasts too long. For example, this case we have uh, 2010. Uh, before the canine, and then after we've done the treatment, it's gone to a B1, the canine, and the uh, the front teeth from A3, A2, gone to 1, M1. And then the patient hasn't had anything done in eight, eight and a half years and came back for review. And I was I was surprised and also quite pleased to see that it lasted quite long. I see the color obviously gone down slightly, but still A1, uh, gone down B1, but eight and a half years, still so much whiter than what it was before. This is eight and a half years. Obviously, I have many two years result, three year result, but eight and a half years. This is the longest I have on a review. Nicola, uh, born in 1990. Uh, she got a white patches there, a very inter interesting case. This one, I'm going to show you this. You can see a tooth has so many different colors. I just want to look at what color that white patches is. And then it showed me it's OM3. So I know that I need to get a teeth to OM3 to make that white patches just disappear into the surrounding of OM3, just like magic. So the aim is to make the teeth the OM3 and that will disappear. Okay, so came to see me in uh, 2009, when she was um, 21. And then uh, came back, uh, not, nothing done before, came back for, uh, for another treatment. Uh, another uh, retreatment five years later. And you see, that is not there yet because the, there's not OM3 yet. So you still can see the white patches there, or maybe the mineralization hasn't taken place. But then came back to see me 2019. Uh, she came back in 2016 as well. So you should come back every three, two, three, five years for, for, for retreat. And uh, that is nearly disappeared. But I just saw her, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased when she booked an appointment. Uh, I was stuck in China for nine months. I came back. She wanted to see me. When she came in, I was so happy. When I took the uh, the, the crystal eye, it's totally gone. I know that I've gone into O and three now. It's gone. So so beautiful. The white patch is not no not noticeable now. So imagine that you start with that, and twelve years later, your teeth is still so beautiful. So they do last a long time, and they like they can last forever if you chop it up every year. So let's look at the scope and limitation of teeth whitening. 
yes, we know that it cannot align teeth. So if your teeth are crowd, uh, about, uh, you're crowding, we cannot change that. Yes, we know that if the tooth shape is not ideal, we cannot change that either, but we can change the color that, that we can do. We, we, we done a survey uh, in 2010, uh, because at that time, uh, an older dentist uh, worked with me and I would try to, I try to refer, uh, I, I try to up, upsell. Uh, after their teeth whitening done, I asked them whether they, they like to have, uh, if their teeth are not straight or, 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 um, or crowded, whether they have orthodontic treatment done. Uh, this is try to refer to, the, to our orthodontist. I found that that uh, eighty-two percent of the patients are, are happy just with their teeth whitened, even though they are not straight. Not not those really really crooked teeth. I'm talking about blood like mouth crowd. They really don't mind. But in my experience, when the teeth are nice and white, like OM3, they look really nice, even though they're a little bit unevenness. They look so natural, really natural. And um, I think that um, eighty-two percent is a is a is a big proportion of our uh, population are happy just to have their teeth whitened and nothing else done. Obviously, I think it's a cost as well, uh, because if you do orthodontic treatment, the teeth whitening, uh, maybe between like 500 to 1,000 pounds, we're talking about orthodontic treatment, uh, here is about 6,000 pounds, it's like a lot more. So I think co po probably it's a, it's a cost as well that put a lot of people off having to have the uh, treatment done. And thank you. Uh, I started 10 minutes earlier, so I've got plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Andrew. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Chan. If there's any big questions, if anybody wants to pop in the chat now for Dr. Chan while we've still got him. Yeah, I think there's a lot of chat there. Let me have a look. Okay, let me see. Anyone online want to uh, ask Dr. Chan a question? Okay, to say thank you so much, but no question. Okay, lots, lots of compliments, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, thank you for the great presentation. Did you use any additional material to mineralize the teeth? Uh, very, very interesting uh, question because many, many of my students ask me that. The answer is no, uh, but but it's all in the products. It's all in the in in the products. If you use good products, is a uh, it's, it's a science and uh, some products can, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a product that re, it just, that, that do the remineralization uh, because in the products, there's no calcium, no uh, phosphate, but you could have something, you could have something that will encourage the phosphate and, and the calcium and phosphate from our saliva to deposit it onto the teeth surfaces. That is the key. That is, that is a secret and that's a magic. Okay, this is a great um, a question. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Chan? Okay, if there's no um, question, I'd like Andrew and uh, you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it all back uh, to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan. We really appreciate your time today. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to see you back in Birmingham soon when all this pandemic is over. Yes, I hope so too. Um, just for the record, Dr. Chan also whitened my teeth and I can vouch that the results were absolutely amazing. <laughs> I also teach at uh, uh, the College of Medicine and Dentistry, and that's why I do. I teach MSD students. If you guys want to learn more about teeth whitening, please enroll. Uh, you're going to you're going to you an amazing teeth whitening at the dentist as well as an aesthetic uh, as well as a as a restorative uh, dentist. Thank you, Dr. Chan. That's great.
okay, I say goodbye and thank you. And thank you for um, um, uh, well, um, uh, watching. So um, if you want to get hold of me, um, we can uh, get, we can get through um, uh, Andrew and Andrew got all my uh, contact uh, the details. Thank you, Dr. Chan. That's great. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to check if Dr. Ziad is available now because we can just move on with the next lecture if he is. Just I am available. Hi, Andrew. Fantastic. Thank you, Ziad. Nice right. to see your face, even though it's, I only saw you yesterday in the College of Dentistry, so it's nice to see you again. Um, I'll give you a, an introduction. So this is Professor Ziad al Ani. Dr. Al Ani was awarded his MSc in prosthodontics from Manchester University in 1999. In 2004, he was awarded his doctorate from the same university. The title of his thesis was Studies in Temporomandibular Disorders and Occlusion. He was appointed by Manchester University as a clinical teacher in restorative dentistry in 2004, as well as a research coordinator for the TMD clinic and is recently a senior lecturer at Glasgow Dental Hospital and School. In 2006, he obtained MFDS from the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. In, recogni in recognition of his teaching activities, he was awarded the status of Fellow of Higher Education Academy in 2010. Dr. Al Ani was one of the two finalists in the Teacher of the Year 2006, as awarded by the Dental Defence Union. The award recognised excellence in dental education. He was again a nominee for the 2007 and 2008 Dentist Teacher of the Year Award by the Dental Defence Union after nominations made by undergraduate students at Manchester Dental School. He has published numerous articles on occlusion and TMD in peer-reviewed scientific papers and he is the author of the book Temporomandibular Dis Disorders, A Problem-Based Approach and the book Practical Procedures in Dental Occlusion. Today's lecture is on occlusal considerations in anterior restorations. Thank you, Professor Ziad. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this uh, meeting. Um, I'm, I'm well known by my interactive lectures, uh, actually, and I want always my uh, the audience to be engaged in the lecture. And I have reasons for that. I'll show, you, show that in a minute. Can I ask all the participants if uh, you please can uh, go on this website, uh, polf.com forward slash ziadalani745. I want you to vote for a couple of questions or maybe more, uh, just to uh, as an ice breaking first. And the other thing is I'm of the like seeking opinions about what you're doing at the moment in practice. So please go everybody to this uh, using your smartphone polf.com forward slash 745 and you should see uh, the following one you should see yeah. something like this one okay right and just put your actual name please don't put any funny names because i might expose the names trust me uh, i'm joking this is anonymous all right so uh, please just uh, put your actual name in case of like uh, if you want you to see your scores or a proof of your attendance as well, that would be good. So we can actually prove that you attended the lectures for your CPD uh, or other things. So I just want to make sure that everybody went to this polf.com forward slash the other and you already registered your name to be able to vote in this lecture. Okay. Just so to help everyone, I've just popped it into the chat as well so they can copy Excellent. and paste it. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's really useful. Thank you. Okay, so yes, copy and paste if you want in your browser. Just put it in a normal browser, you should see this. I just uh, had some screenshots of what you may see in your smartphone. Okay. Right, so let's start. Oh, well, uh, already people started. I want you, first of all, just to uh, you know, put a vote here in which category best describes you here. So we, some people start already voting. Well done. Okay, getting more. Yeah, I can see more GDPs and dental practitioners. One specialist. Very good. Okay. Yeah, people are just voting as they register now. I know that's really good. So the system works very well. And I'll show you the reason why we need, I like actually to use this in a lecture like occlusion. You know, occlusion is a dry topic. Uh, people find it sometimes hard 
to understand or hard uh, to listen to sometimes it's uh, uh, really really good to make it interactive so people are voting already so that's fine i know uh, the link is here guys still here and it is in the chat box uh, posted uh, kindly by andrew okay i can see a few people voting so most of them the gdps uh, and two specialists are getting more voting now so let's move on and this is the reason for why I like my Zoom lectures to be interactive. Because traditional lectures on Zoom, not terribly impressive anymore. I don't want anybody like this or you know, nodding off in my lecture. So that's the reason for making it interactive. I believe in this, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me, I understand. And I like to put uh, the chocolate on the top of the broccoli to make it delicious and to benefit from what's been underneath here. So putting some, some things, some spices, some flavors on the top of occlusion topic will make it easy to digest. So we know occlusion, the word occlusion is, by the way, the easiest definition uh, in dentistry, if you want, and it's the most difficult to understand and uh, everybody believes in that, but because our lecture is about you know aesthetics i tried actually to get some tips related to occlusion in anterior teeth because when we say occlusion people always think about the bite about posterior teeth but how about the anterior teeth so look at that the best restorative and periodontal will fail with a bad occlusion and if you don't get into uh, sorry if you do get into trouble and understanding the occlusion will generally get you out of it if you don't understand the occlusion you won't find the, uh, an answer for some of the clinical problems you don't have predictable results in, in terms of restorative dentistry so again don't overlook this very crucial part of examination which is examining the occlusion and the occlusion can be a soul destroying experience and i know many of my colleagues who had years in practice they had or they met patients who actually fed up with, you know, patching up their restorations and keep fracturing again. But the question should be asked here, is the problem in the materials, in the dental materials here, or there's something else? There's something else could be the occlusion as one important factor of causing this catastrophic fail. And you have to remember that occlusion is more than adjusting high occlusal contact, is more than detecting it with the articulating paper and adjusting it. This is not occlusion. So we need to now think beyond this. We need to go now the extra mile of examining the occlusion to, to know what could be the factors of causing this fail. So let me put this uh, like a slide in front of you on the screen. And, uh, you know, I just want you to think about what could be the cause of this drifting of upper incisors of this patient chipped and worn anterior teeth of the other patient repeated fracturing of class four incisor restorations composite restorations for example uh, like previous veneers keep breaking and chipping off all of this related to again anterior teeth and anterior restorations what could be the reason when let's vote for that when occlusal trauma is not evident i put that because i know that people you can type in now guys i i know that some people will say now occlusal trauma i'm sure that will happen so occlusal trauma this is a wide term but what we mean by occlusal trauma is it a high restoration is a high like a, a restoration not done in a proper occlusion because it's actually raising the bite or what what is the main reason so let's see what the participants think about that. So just put a couple of words here. What could be the reason for these clinical problems? Let's see if there are any answers. Okay. No responses yet. So people are shy to vote. Just write anything you think is the reason for failure of this don't worry i'm not going to show names guys names not going to be shown here it's anonymous i promise okay so no voting yet
Come on, guys. Any votes here? Bruxism. Oh, well done. The first vote here. First brave one. Para function, you mean here. Okay. Erosion. Okay, that could be the reason from palatal erosion here, but you can see fracture of the restorations, uh, chipping of, of like uh, a veneer. Okay, uh, don't think erosion is the reason here. But a function and bruxism, yes, that could be the reason for that. Yeah. Other than that, if say that the patient we examined the patient, the patient is not aware of uh, bruxism, but you know that only 20% of patients they can tell that they clench and grind uh, uh, their teeth and we usually know by the partner who couldn't sleep because of uh, you know uh, the noise of clenching and grinding but again we have other uh, methods of detecting you know the uh, signs of active bruxism in soft tissues but say that you know we couldn't find any like evidence of a bar para function or bruxism what could be other reasons but this is very very sensible answer Okay, let's see. You know, guys, there's something called the envelope of movement. So the jaw has like some sort of, you know, uh, different points between centric relation, which is the uh, jaw relationship, the centric occlusion or ICP, intercuspid position, which is the heat, this is the teeth relationship. And we can uh, push the jaw forward, we can open maximally. So the jaw has some shape of an envelope, we call it positive envelope, and everybody knows about that. And we have here two, two areas, which is centric occlusion and centric relation. And look at this study by Pamiger, which shows out of 686 contacts, 588 were in centric occlusion and 15 in centric relation. And the other study showed that uh, of 180 swallows, we have 162 tooth to contact in centric occlusion and five in centric relation. That means this position shouldn't be neglected, the centric relation. So it is jaw relationship. It might not by, uh, be like within the function, the normal function, but that could be utilized by some patients that this study showed. And this study is actually a telemetric registration. So it shows there is an evidence that the use of this jaw relationship. So some people might be actually having, you know, some function between centric relation and centric occlusion. So there are some movements, for example. And when you do your occlusal examination, one of the important things which shouldn't be overlooked when you examine the occlusion is to examine the centric occlusion, which is the bite, the habitual bite, the maximum intercuspation, okay, and the centric relation. So you should be able to develop the skill to examine this in order to see the direction of the slide. The reason for that, because if your restorations will change this direction of the slide from centric relation to centric occlusion, or will interfere with this envelope, which I showed you here, okay, this might be cause some bad effects on the restorations or on the masticatory system. So centric relation is a concept, of course, I can't cover it in this lecture, but you need to learn this skill. And we use it in restorative dentistry in different aspects. So let me give you some examples. First of all, in order to adopt the conformative approach, which I mentioned already, that we don't need to, we don't actually want to change this relationship between centric relation and centric occlusion. We don't want to change the slide, for example, okay, in order not that to affect the masticatory system. So we, do, we need to keep the envelope the, of movement as it is for patients when we do simple restorative dentistry. In order to do that, you need to be able to examine the centric relation, examine the slide between the centric relation and in the cuspid position before you start your restorative work and recording it and making sure after you providing your restorations that this, this is wasn't changed. This is the important part in uh, simple restorative dentistry, which we call it conformative approach. Now, when you plan to reorganize the occlusion, when you want to change the OVD, for example, we want to manage a case of tooth surface loss. We don't have now any more a reproducible position in 
uh, ICP in intercuspid position, we don't have a reproducible bite. So we need another reference point, another reproducible, repeatable, reliable three R's position, which is the centric relation. Because centric relation is still there because it's, it is jaw relationship. It's not teeth relationship. Teeth are worn down, teeth are gone. I still have another position which I can build up my restrictions on, which is called centric relation and it is reproducible and it is original. I mean, in the patient's envelope, I didn't create any new position. And this is the same position we use when we do complete dentures, of course. When we try to make a stabilization splint to manage a patient uh, with myofascial pain or a patient with a bruxism, or we want to use a splint to test the increase of OVD in advanced restorative dentistry when we manage to surface loss, for example, I need again to make this splint in centric relation. So I need to learn how to get and register centric relation. And I highlighted the last one, which is the slide between RCP and ICP could be associated with some occlusive problems in some patients. So these occlusive problems I showed you, I'll come back to it. These occlusive problems shown in this slide actually could be a result of a deflective contact between RCP and ICP. You won't be, imagine that a problem at the back teeth, for example, causing a problem in anterior teeth, you know, and I'll show you how uh, in the next slides. And this concept of centric relation, by the way, of course, is well known in the field of occlusion. And Peter Dawson was one of the pioneers uh, in occlusion around the world. He said this, which I quoted, out of the factors of occlusion, centric relation is the single most important that must be understood by every dentist who works on teeth. And this guy spent his entire life career in occlusion, and he's the founder of uh, Dawson's Academy, of course, in the United States, a well-known uh, academy. And he published this book, which again talks in details about centric relation and the importance of knowing that and the importance of developing the technique of knowing them. So coming back to our main point, the slide between RCP, which is the retruded contact position in centric relation, and between the ICP could be deflective. That means it actually causes an extensive movement of the jaw. And that might be the cause for wear, drifting, mobility, and a typical loss of bone support in the anterior teeth. For example, if you have a patient, when you probe it with the uh, perio probe, you find no perio evident in the other teeth, but there is a big bony pocket around one anterior tooth. You might say this is occlusive trauma, but this is a general term. If we want to know what type of clusal trauma, of course, we need actually uh, to, to check that. And checking the contact between RCP and ICP is one of the examination should be done here. And correcting it, it actually, will, will, most of the cases will reduce the trauma on the anterior tooth. So again, a problem in deflective contact from RCP to ICP causing a problem in the anterior teeth. So we need to check, check this slide so we need to learn this technique how to find uh, you know the centric relation and check this slide which could be the cause of some anterior teeth to uh, surface loss here uh, and see the slide between rcp and icp and assessing the occlusion of course needs of it's a full package guys it's not only putting the patient ch checking the icp and rcp you need to get the models articulated in semi-adjustable articulators using a face four of course and we can actually demonstrate all of these movements on the articulator itself and you know learning this skill this is acquired skill improves with practice you need to practice that in order to master this centric relation okay so uh, the way of the operators, how the operator is sitting uh, in the chair, I you know the level of the, for example, the elbows and the patient's supine position and how the patient's neck extended slightly, the chin pointed upwards. All of these factors are important to get, uh, you know, the centric relation uh, found and registered correctly. And even the ways of putting the thumbs uh, and the fingers we try to manipulate the jaw here. It's called by manual manipulation. We don't push the jaw, of course. You know, it's like a big topic, the centric relation, as I said. And I mean, there's not a the scope of this lecture, but one of the elements you need to master if you want to really to control the occlusion and to know the reasons for some uh, like uh, uh, failed restorations 
which are related to occlusion, you need to master the technique of finding center activation and watching the slides from RCP to ICP, of course. Okay, I want you now, this is, uh, so the first thing, the first take home message to learn that you need to examine the occlusion, you need to examine the articulatory system, of course, in general, you, uh, you know, examining the TNJs, the uh, muscles of mastications and the occlusion, and within the occlusive examination, you need to be uh, really competent at finding centriculation and recording it. Now, I, I want to touch on other factors which might cause the problems of the anterior teeth. I want you using your fingertips. Yeah, I've got some now locations here. Just click on the photo, which you think it's like the correct shape of a crown in terms of morphology. So I have participants clicked on this shape. I have now participants clicking on this one here. Okay, let's see who's the winner for this one. Okay, so more clicks on the one on the left hand side. Okay, few on the right hand side only. Let's see. Keep on clicking, guys. Okay, more to the left hand side. Yes, I think yeah, this makes sense. Look at the palatal aspect of the anterior crown here, as opposed to the one here. So we need to consider the palatal aspect carefully when we prepare the crowns, guys, for anterior restorations. Because we need to consider the movement of the mandible on this like palatal aspect in protrusion. And this shouldn't be like a slope or th thick one, thick palatal uh, surface or cingulum, because that will obstruct the protrusive movement, as you can see here. So this the process of movement needs to be done smoothly in the correct shape of the uh, like palatal aspect of the anterior tooth. This actually uh, leads us to a concept called the freedom and centric, which is freedom and centric. It means that the teeth, when they occlude posteriorly, they should allow slight movement of the cusp tip inside the fossa rather than to be a wedge. So the posterior teeth, when they occlude, they need the cusp needs to have some room for it to move slightly forward. If you you have the tip uh, here, the fossa is pointed, and you have the palatal aspect is thick, this actually will allow no freedom in centric, and that means we have excessive forces applied on the anterior teeth. So two things you have to remember here: anterior teeth shouldn't be a thick slope here should be the correct morph morphology on the palatal aspect when you restore that. And posterior teeth, which are related to anterior teeth as well, should have a room in the fossa for the freedom and centric. So freedom and centric is related to both the posterior and the anterior in order to achieve it, okay? Which is called long centric sometimes uh, in other books. So again, this will not allow freedom and centric here, but this one will allow it. So you might do actually some anterior restorations, which they look marvelous. They look absolutely great in terms of the aesthetic, but the patient feels that them locked. Locked means they can't have any room of movement there. And with time, you can tell the consequences of that. So again, because of neglecting the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth to be reproduced in the correct morphology, or a problem in restoring posterior teeth when you make the fossa like point, uh, point fossa. So again, it's not enough only to give some room here. You need to give the correct morphology. The technician can do any uh, crown for you here with a, a thin layer of porcelain of PFM, but with a wrong morphology. So something like, okay, you look after the labial aspects of the teeth, but how about the palatal aspects of the teeth? So if you don't get the correct forward movement, the correct, uh, occlusion here, you will end up with the failed anterior restorations because of the poor morphology of the anterior uh, palatal aspects. Okay, so and this is quite common. That could be related to lack of feral effect, of course, here. But again, feral effect, uh, the uh, results of the lack of feral effect is more of longitudinal fracture of the root rather than, you know, uh, de-cementing of the uh, post-crown here.
So remember, if you go back to our undergraduate knowledge about preparation of the anterior teeth, you need it to be in two planes here, of course. And guess what? Don't be shy of or you feel yeah, that you above it, that you use the silicon index, even with an expert. There is no harm of using this one, which will make a big difference on knowing, you know, that you've got enough preparation and the exact shape with the cingulum and the palatal aspect of the teeth, especially in important teeth like canines. We'll talk about canines as well, how, why it's very important to reproduce the palatal aspect uh, correctly. So using the correct bear while preparation, using silicon index, will help a lot in getting this sorted okay so if you want to get a, a good function you need to get a good morphology in your preparation and if you want to uh, your, de your technician to provide you with the good uh, restoration with the uh, excellent morphology you need your preparation to be spot on in first place so always measure the thickness of the temporary the thickness of the temporary will give you an idea about your preparation and about you know uh, that you have enough room and the shape of it as well okay so that's a, a good opportunity not to be missed here freedom and centric how would you know that if you have freedom and centric or not if you have uh, your your fingers are clean now while you're listening to my lecture okay guys or sanitized okay you make sure that your hand is clean you can put your finger on the labial aspect of the anterior upper anterior and or upper incisors and just tap tap on your back teeth okay if you feel any sort of tremor you know a jerking movement there and the anterior teeth that means you don't have a freedom in center this is a simple one to test this is like a not very objective of course this is subjective assessment for that but gives you an idea whether you have freedom in centric or not okay i'm sure now people are testing their teeth and you can tell Again, this is an example of how to create a freedom and centric by, you know, or helping creating freedom and centric by increasing the width of the fossa. This fossa will allow freedom and centric occlusion, but this one, the pointed one, will not allow it. In terms of implants, for example, this is very important, whether it will are uh, implants, uh, sorry, anterior implants or posterior implants, you need to reduce the load on them. And, you know, it's always advisable when you have implant supported crown to have a big fossa here to allow some freedom centric wider than usual okay so about two to three millimeters platform you know uh, with the opposing uh, teeth so no freedom in centric is described actually as a, what we call it constricted chewing pattern or ccp this restricted envelope of function it might actually cause some problems or you know chipping of the anterior porcelain or you know crowns uh, which is again something it needs to be always uh, uh, in mind so a patient with the ccp might present with chipped wound anterior teeth and sometimes tmj symptoms you have to be careful about the relationship between uh, like the tmj or tmd and occlusion uh, i wrote a uh, like a review article about that published last year uh, in general for primary dental care about this and you know this is still not supported by evidence you know that you know any clues or problems might cause a, a TMD so I have to be careful about that but here we're talking about the restorations so something like that you know these meant to be palatal aspects of the teeth of course they should look like a label aspects of teeth you can actually warn them two faces there so um Again, especially in patients class two, DEF2, the skeletal pattern is important as well here. Bulky cingulums, all of these will cause this constricted chewing pattern. How would you examine it more precisely than tapping on your back teeth and putting the finger on the label aspect I just showed you? You can use the what you call the secret of success in occlusion, which is shimmer stock foil. Okay, shimmer stock foil. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a minute uh, in a little bit of details and how uh, all the advantages of using it. Uh, so what we do, we can ask the patient to sit upright here and close the teeth together, putting the shimstock foil held by Miller's forceps here, as you can see. And then uh, the, patient, the patient can actually uh, 
sorry, catch the, uh, the shim stock between the teeth there, so we can't uh, pu uh, pull it through. And then we change the patient's uh, head position, so tilt it backwards, and we'll see if the shim stock is still held between the teeth, this patient has this contracted uh, chewing pattern or the, the no freedom and centric, because even changing the position of the cone dies didn't change the contact point here. So the patient have a very close contact between the anterior teeth in other terms. So shim stock foil, you can, I'm, I'm sure many of my colleagues, they know it, it's eight microns foil. It has many advantages. So let me see how many of you using shim stock foil, guys. If you can vote for that, do you use shim stock foil? Yes or no? Okay, so getting some votes here, almost 50 50. Okay, so people who are voting here, we have the vast majority not using the shim stock foil. This is one of the take home messages, guys, from my uh, brief lecture today is to get that in your drawer for a crucial examination. It is very useful foil, has, it's versatile, has multiple use in dental practice. Let me show you uh, some of the use of that. It is actually a feeler gauge. This is the, the definition of the shim stock. So usually we use it in practice uh, to check whether the tissue restrictions, they have occlusion or they are infracluded. You see what I mean? Because eight microns thickness there. It, it doesn't have ink, of course. It doesn't mark the teeth. So the important of that, you can actually check whether the articulation of models are correct or not. Because when you take impressions for study models and you pour them with the uh, stone and cast them and you put them in articulator and you put the bite registration material, sometimes there are potential errors there in the articulation. So you have an eight microns gauge. So if you put this eight microns between the patient's teeth, all right, and then record that, that for example, the upper six with the lower six, they hold the shim stock. The upper four, it doesn't hold the shim stock because there's a little bit of gap. This is the patient's occlusion. And you can ask the technician or yourself, if you have your articulated models in the articulator, to check by putting the shim stock between the stone, between the study models, okay? And then check whether it's the same clinically. That means your articulation is spot on. Okay, and vice versa. So if, for example, your clinical record showing that upper six with the lower six, they are catching the shim stock here, but on the lab, it's pulled through. That means there is a problem in the articulation, as simple as that. Okay, so you have an accuracy down to eight microns with that. The other advantage of using it, this is something, you know, in field of occlusion, guys, most of it, it's not evidence-based. Let, let, let's talk about the facts there. There are some suggestions from patient people, sorry, uh, uh, experience, okay. Uh, but we don't have like evidence-based studies to show it is a must to use this protocol, for example, or not. In most of the aspects of occlusion. But one of the things which is advisable, let's say, rather than a protocol, is to, when you do implants dentistry, you should have some sort of clearance of about 30 microns between the implant supported uh, prosthesis or crown and again, the opposing teeth. In order to do that, how would you gauge these 30 microns? We have eight microns thickness of the shim stock. So if we fold it to four layers there, four layers should be gripped between the teeth there, but three layers should be pulled through. You see what I mean? That means there is a clearance by 30 microns. It doesn't need you know, extensive math skills to figure this out. So again, yes, we can use it, to estimate how much clearance we want. Uh, one of the things introduced by this company, you know, uh, which will be very helpful because somebody might ask, how would I compare the clinical uh, findings of shim stock hold with the lab? You can get this sheet. I'm happy to post it for you. Um, it's available on the web, I'm sure. Um, and it's called shim stock holds very simply, uh, simple sheet can be used easily. So you can actually put marks for example between one one and four one is the shim stock held between these teeth put yes or no again between one six and four six we found it held put yes and then send this to the uh, over to the technician 
the technician will compare it with the cast and will make sure that the articulation was absolutely spot on correct. Okay, so again, a sheet like this one, simple one, can facilitate the communication between you and the technician regarding the accuracy of articulation. So coming back to the management of the constricted chewing pattern uh, uh, I showed you, um, we said that, okay, the patient doesn't have freedom in centric and you uh, provide the patient with some composite restorations, for example, anterior teeth. So if the patient has this strong bite anteriorly, so there is no freedom in centric, let's say, you need to do something about giving some sort of easing of this area. If we use thin articulating paper, you might actually remove uh, some of the cruiser contacts and create a gap between the teeth. We don't want infracluded restorations, guys. This will cause over eruption and will cause disturbance of the occlusion of the patient. Unless we do something like dull concept, which is completely different there, you know, when you leave some gaps in posterior teeth, this is monitored, okay? But again, coming back to this one, so use 200 microns articulating papers and ask the patient to chew on that and get some marks there. These are marked by 200 microns. Easing this one until you don't have marks and use these thin articulated paper, which is 40, you should have some marks there. So this will create some room in anterior teeth and reduce the load on them in case of the CCP, as we said, okay? So, uh, so this is something to, to avoid as a preventive measure to avoid problems in your anterior restorations in a patient with a CCP or lack of freedom in centric. Remember, guys, other things which is very important. When you talk about anterior teeth, we have canines as well. When you involve your canines in the restorations, you have to be extremely careful about not disturbing the pre-existing occlusal scheme. If the patient has canine guidance, for example, I don't want to create an interference. I need to keep this guidance, okay? If the patient has group function, I need to keep this group function. I'm talking about simple restorative dentistry to conformative approach. So that's why I like, and you know, extensive care should be put there to reproduce the palatal aspects of the canines. You remember the palatal aspects of the canines, they're not bulky, they're not uh, like uh, a slope that we have a ridge, we have two fossa or slopes there. So this is actually there for a purpose because the canine guidance could be on expense of one of these slopes. If you make it bulky, if we make it like a, a, a belly shape there, that will obstruct the movement of the jaw and will actually lock the teeth in the lateral exertions. And we see a lot of problems with, the, unfortunately, full mouth, uh, you know, uh, porcelain, uh, full mouth rehabilitation with porcelain crowns or veneers, whatever, and the patient, okay, was over the moon after receiving this because it's marvelous aesthetics, but uh, as simple as that, they can't move the jaw, it's locked. The, those patients who have remunerary chewing pattern, they will not be able to do that. They will not to be able to actually slide the, the jaw right or left because you actually obstructed it with the poor morphology of the canine, something like that, bulky palatal surface. Okay, so again, this won't help. This is not the palatal aspect of the canine, something like that reasonably, okay? So look after that. The poor morphology will end up with poor guidance. So the patient will not be able to make uh, like a letter extensions with the good guidance. So most of these restorations will be replaced not only for the aesthetic reason because they're not good, but sometimes the aesthetically acceptable, as I said, but functionally they're not. So you have to look after uh, this area when you do the palatal preparation of the canine, of course. So good prep good morphology of frustration, better knowledge of tooth morphology can help to optimize that. So that case actually uh, needed to be redone with, uh, you know, a new wax up. Wax up using semi-adjustable articulator should, of course, uh, achieve this lateral movement with the canine guide as a groove function. And by looking after the shapes of the upper and lower canines, either palatal aspects or the label aspects of the lower canines here to achieve this disclusion in the lateral exertions. Whether you use a digital system or using, you know, traditional way is the same thing. The same principles have to be applied in looking after the morphology of the 
anterior teeth, and especially the canines. This is a case published in BDJ a long time ago, which showed the patient couldn't tolerate this bridge, and the problem was the bulky uh, palatal uh, surface of the canine. The first thing you do here, guys, before replacing the existing bridge with a brand new one, get the temporary. And on the temporary, try to achieve some guidance here on the teeth. Once the patient is happy with that, and most of the cases, the patient would be absolutely satisfied by having a guidance there, you can actually copy that in your final restorations. Okay. The other thing is the, to consider the protrusive movements as well. The protrusive movements when you have like a, a class four restoration or you have a veneer, make sure if you have guidance on adjacent teeth, on a sound tooth in protrusive movement, you don't need contact and protrusive movements of the restoration. As long as there is a sound tooth which can actually ensure the guidance there. So if this tooth can ensure a protrusive guidance, you don't need a contact on uh, your restoration. So that will save you troubles, possible troubles of that. Especially if you have thin veneers, you need to avoid the guidance on them. And when you have veneers like that, try to get the cruiser contacts mainly, not on the interface, of course, between the restoration and the tooth. Try to get the cruiser contact in the sound tooth and the guidance, if you can avoid it, if there is like, like adjacent tooth, which is not to make it on the expense of that tooth. <clears throat> the last point I want to mention here, guys, about, you know, uh, we're talking about the importance of the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth, okay, uh, in terms of the guidance, the protrusive movements. So when you prepare the teeth, if you prepare multiple anterior teeth, eventually you're going to end up with uh, losing the shape or the morphology of the palatal aspects because you prepare them. So you send the, te the technician the impression and, uh, you know, they've got the cast and everything and try to wax up these uh, restorations. So they wax them up, okay, could be like a nice to wax up in the palatal aspects, but it is not the same morphology exactly like the one before preparation. I think you got the point, okay? So we're losing here a, a guide. So if you prepare the teeth, I don't have an adjacent tooth which shows me the shape of the palatal teeth for this specific patient. You know, that might differ between patients. So what would you do? It's advisable in these cases is what you do is the technique one is to do what you call the crown about method. This is a modified this photo just to explain what I want to say. It's crown about method that you do every other tooth. So prepare one tooth, leave one. Don't do them at one go. Okay, this will cost you and the patient an extra visit, but that will help the technician in waxing up the palatal aspect of this tooth by looking at the adjacent tooth still there. You see what I mean? And then when the, you, you fit the crown here, you can get, um, you know, uh, the, the, the technician can get the morphology from the crown, which is already in a place. Somebody might say, oh, how about the shade? The shade, of course, you selecting the shade carefully and the, the, the technician is using the same system. There is no here any sort of concerns about, you know, uh, making another visit and, you know, copying the same shade. That's not a problem at all. But you need here two impressions, of course, and you need, you know, uh, more than one visit. But that will ensure the post the palatal aspects is being reproduced exactly like the teeth before preparation. So we can actually, uh, as I said, so I just move this one. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just move this one. Sorry. Yes, so now the other technique, so that one, when you have teeth, you need to prepare. The other technique, when you have two surface locks, locks like this one, so you don't have originally any sort of morphology of the teeth, and you need to crown these teeth of the posterior, for example, the definitive, uh, you know, including the posterior teeth, if the definitive treatment is like crowns on the anterior teeth, get the temporary right. So once you get the temporary right, what you do, make sure that the patient, of course, using the accurate impression, the face pool, and you articulated them, and the uh, semi adjustable articulator has done the wax up, and you fabricated the temporary. So this, these are the stages. Make sure when you do the temporary, okay, that you get the occlusion in static and dynamic occlusion, right, in terms of the guidance. So we will spend some time, uh, you know, adjusting the palatal aspects of the temporary until you get the guidance, of course, between posterior and anterior teeth. And then you now satisfied 
uh, of course, I just mentioned that, that the, the temporary situations here, although we tell them temporary, call them temporary, it's more than temporary, they are provisional. The, the reason for that, because it's not only a cap to, uh, you know, cover the tooth, it's actually testing the tolerance of the these restorations and the OVD and the occlusal scheme, which we produce. So it's more than a temporary. I like this article by uh, Professor Trevor Berg, a uh, long time ago, it's 2005, which is saying that the provision is, is not just a temporary, talking about the provisional crowns. So get the, the, yourself a good material of the provisional crowns in order to test it, test the occlusal scheme as well. So once you get that, now the temporary is ready and it's actually done according to a good occlusion because you spend time testing the static occlusion, the lateral exertions, you adjusted them until you got the canine guidance or group function sorted. Now I'm going to do the definitive restoration. So how would I copy the palatal aspects of the temporary, which is already in good occlusion in my definitive restorations? Okay, so first of all, we need to check that there's no fracture, everything. If there is any fracture or mobility or sensitivity or cement failure or discomfort or drifting, that means the patient's not tolerating, of course, the occlusive scheme or the increase of OVD, if there is an increase of OVD. So that's, of course, uh, it is, uh, you know, sorted already. Now I want to copy the palatal aspects of that, which are in a good occlusion. In restorative dentistry, there is, uh, after, you know, for example, you've got the occlusion right here, you've got canine guidance, there's no canine here, so the medial aspect of the premolar took the guidance, so it's a perfect palatal aspect, I want to copy it in my definitive restorations. So we take the impressions, we take a face pull, of course, and we request what is anterior guidance. Copy the anterior guidance is a known um, procedure in restorative dentistry to actually copy the shape of the palatal aspects of the, especially of the temporaries in the lab. So how would you do that? You get a little bit of a duralay, you know the duralay, if everybody knows the duralay, which is uh, self-cured acrylic material basically. And it, uh, the advantage of using it gives you good working time. You get it like a dough, right? So on the semi-adjustable articulator, that's in the lab. So you have here, Pay attention to this, guys. This is an impression and this a cast of the temporaries, if the pro, of the provisionals. So we took an impression of the temporaries or the provisionals, and we have a cast here. We articulated them. The dough here is soft. So what we do in articulator, we try to move the articulator forward. We move it to the lateral side, uh, sorry, right-hand side, left-hand side, yeah, lateral exertions. We do all the dynamic movements. This the incisal pin here and the articulator now is going to create a shape inside the door itself, inside the duralay. And this shape is based on how the lower moving on the upper is the opposite in the articulator, of course, based on the shape of the temporary from inside, you know, because, you know, this will create a shape which is, which looks like the palatal aspects of the temporary because the movement is done by the temporaries here. So have something like that on the table itself. So what we do do now, look at that. This is the, again, a close up. This is the temporary, okay? This is the provisionals. And moving now with them on the articulator, we created a shape here. So let's do uh, show that show that in this illustration. So these are the temporaries moving. Look at that. The shape created here looks like the shape of the pattern aspects here because that's exactly how the jaw is moving uh, on this particular patient. Now, we have, uh, we remove the temporaries from the articulator. We get the, the prepared teeth and the prepared teeth now, it's gonna be waxed up. The wax up should, the wax should actually make the same movement here. And the guide for us is this right here. So say for example, we wax it up this way, right? And we try to move, the jaw is not moving. We, we carve it, remove it from it until this movement happening here. So this shape here of the template will guide us to the shape of the palatal aspect. So by doing that, we copied the palatal aspects of the temporaries 
which were done in a patient's mouth with a good occlusion. Maybe it's difficult to explain it sometimes, you know, in slides when I show you a, a video, we can do that in our teaching in the college, we show videos and we demonstrate that in the lab as well. But let me show you that, you know, that the pin can move from this side. This, this actually was soft, so created a shape here. The same one we use it when we create the final uh, restoration. So you can see here, after waxing up, you can see that the shape is created here and there is a smooth movement inside it. That means the, the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth is the same like the provisionals. I think uh, uh, we can stop here, but before that, uh, all, most of the procedures, we uh, put them together in a book, uh, which is uh, published already now. The hard copy is going to be on shelves in November. You, you can actually order you the uh, pre-order uh, already now of a book called Practical Procedures and Dental Occlusion, uh, where my good friend Riaz Yar, my, myself, indeed quarantine, actually, we had a good chance to do some Zoom meetings, actually, to finalize this book, which is a book targeting general dental practitioners for uh, in, in the subject of occlusion and it's mainly practical procedures so we try not to uh, like uh, touch in details in the theory uh, but to make it like a uh, practical and there is like a link for videos in a website when you purchase the book you can access to see all the practical procedures in the video. So uh, thank you very much for your listening and I am happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Ziad. If anybody has any questions, can they pop it in the chat window and then Ziad can have a read and answer them for you. Okay. Okay, so thank you. I can't see any more questions. Okay. So far, there is no questions. Okay. okay, I think we've got some thank yous coming in. So uh, thank you yeah. very much, Professor Ziad. I don't think we've got any questions from you. Um, but if anybody doesn't have any questions, they can contact uh, the Knightsbridge Dental Care and send it to the email address info at kbac.uk. So Knightsbridge Academy. Yes, I'm happy to see that, you know, the reason for silence is a clear presentation. Of Absolutely. <laughs> everybody obviously understood thank everything. You. And you. thank you very much. Um, can, so thank you, Ziad. You can sign off now. Just thank want you. to check if um, Raj, are you with us, and are you ready? If you're, I hope able. so. I, hope <laughs> you can see you well. I can see you and hear you clearly. So Excellent. it's it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Raj Rajarayan, OBE. Raj Rajarayan is Professor and Head of Restorative Dentistry at the College of Medicine and Dentistry. He was past Dean at the Royal College of Surgeons in England and responsible for postgraduate dentistry for London as Associate Dean at the London Medical and Dental Deanery. He has delivered, he has delivered over 1,000 international lectures and has helped change continuing professional development in the UK. He was an advisor to the Secretary of State for Health one of the three wise men for the Lord Chancellor on appointments of magistrates and judges and a member of the General Dental Council. He was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen for his services to dentistry. I'm pleased to announce he's presenting on aesthetics and ethics. Is it a paradigm shift? Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much, Andrew. Looks like I've got a lot more time to uh, spend with you if you so wish to have that time spent. By all means, Raj. <laughs> uh, as head of restorative dentistry, I, I can't tell you how delighted I am to have uh, 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 Professor Shamir Mehta, Professor Ziad Al-Ani, and Professor Wyman Chan in my department. 
They are a great strength to our College of Medicine and Dentistry. And from the lectures that you have heard from them, you can see that there is a steep learning curve you can meet if you have your minds open. My lecture, because I'm head of department, can be more challenging. And therefore, they gave me this topic, aesthetics and ethics. Is there a paradigm shift effectively? And I thought I'd share with you what is happening in the Western world and how it might affect you as well because all lands come to the same pathway sooner or later. Of course, these are some advertisements from dental practices, and I, I envy them because I was in Harley Street in a referral only practice, and I did not even have a business card. All my patients came in purely because my colleagues referred them, not because patients referred them, because colleagues referred them. And the one advantage of having a practice, which is a tertiary care practice, doing full mouth reconstructions and colleagues referring patients to you is, they don't usually complain about your bill. So anyway, other practices are not quite so fortunate and they do have to advertise. And here's a very nice advertisement I have seen. And there's another one, even nicer, dedicated to creating beautiful smiles. And then of course, your smile is our vision. But the question I need to ask is, yes, who is it? Who is it that does not do good teeth? Which practice does ugly teeth? Why is all this marketing so important, especially when you have so many other colleagues doing exactly the same thing you are? Or are they, is the question one needs to ask. So this is about practices which are marketing. The next question I need to ask also is the dentists themselves. In the UK, we are very strictly regulated, less strictly now than we used to be regulated. So in those days, we could never advertise. Now we can advertise, but it is unusual, probably unexpected for a dentist in the UK to call themselves the best cosmetic dentist. Even more unusual to be able to advertise as the best cosmetic dentist in a certain town. I mean, having looking at this, I, I'm sure she probably is the best cosmetic dentist in Houston. But when you look at the qualifications, it's about the basic dental qualification anybody could ever have to do dentistry in any country. So with a box standard qualification, to call yourself a best cosmetic dentist, well, it takes a lot of courage. And I admire the courage of some people. And I wish I could be as courageous as some of the people who market. So I actually looked at more American websites. Yes, because I wanted to answer the question, what makes you the best? Whereas some people did not have any credentialing as to what makes them the best. Some people do. So for example, there's a Lux list of modern luxury. Uh, the winner here was a chap called Peter Bolden. And, and that means somebody else has credential. But of course, what does a Lux list mean? Lux list has the best sommelier, that's wine people, the best chef, the best hot couture make, manufact maker, you know, the best dress maker, all that kind of stuff. So, and, and the credentialing of this gentleman is that he's a press, he's the distinction of being a fellow of the Academy of Comprehensive Aesthetics, now part of the Smile Source Network. And I thought, what on earth is that? In any case, I looked into this person uh, because it was very admirable. I mean, I, I was envious of the position that this person had. And I found he also did a course on bulletproof mentality. What is a bulletproof mentality? Usually you have a bulletproof car when somebody's trying to shoot you. So why do you need a bulletproof mentality? And looking even further, I found another course, which was dealing with upset patients. Oops. Then when I looked at the credentials, I saw there was more than just the basic dental qualifications. There was a fellow of something, fellow of another thing, fellow of other things, and fellow of more things. And then I went in and looked to see what these fellowships were. And these fellowships are really based on a lot of societies where people get together and create a club and give each other fellowships. One or two of them actually, you have to answer a question paper and pass. But by and large, most of them are credentialed by being a thoroughly good person or knowing someone who has a good contact. Nevertheless, aesthetic dentistry is very important. Where would Tom Cruise be without getting his teeth fixed? I mean, so many actors, so many personalities, so many politicians, so many royalty, and I should know, I treat a lot of them. 
want to have nicer teeth because they're projecting their personality and their aesthetic appeal. So where does it all leave us? I looked at the last list again because I was curious about this last list. And in fact, in 2019, the same year the other gentleman was on the last list was another dentist called Dr. Alan Malouf. And one thing I loved about him was that he assisted patients uh, with odd hours of dental emergencies and also came through on the social front to give patients tickets to 80 San Francisco Giants baseball games per year. Wow. If that doesn't get you good patience, I'm not sure what will. But sadly, the poor gentleman passed away that same year. Uh, but his sister said, and he was a Jaffa dentist, so in other words, he just extremely well. But his sister said, where he would be with Patty Hearst, Jane Fonda, Ariana Huffington, Prince Charles. I mean, he was a man with the stars. So does that make a good dentist was the question. So the key question for the first part of this lecture is, what makes a good dentist? And having been a very long time in dentistry and in extremely successful practice and having given over a thousand international lectures and produced papers and changed along the way dentistry is taught and, and examined in the UK, I came to the conclusion that being a good dentist, you need good content. Because good contacts make a big difference. Yes, because people come already trusting you. Good marketing is very useful because good marketing adds to the feel good factor of your staff, not just your staff, but also your patients because they think that you are somebody important. A good personality is extremely helpful, especially when you come to cosmetic dentistry, because cosmetic dentistry is absolutely filled with patients with different perceptions to you and if you can get on with them you can convince them you can discuss with them you can empathize with them and they can empathize with you your work will be much better than if you just produce good work alone the emotional intellectual quotient the connection becomes so important so a good personality, a gentle, kind personality, all makes a difference. Good clinical dentistry is very useful. I've seen lots of extremely successful patients, uh, uh, dentists, whose patients I've had to re-reconstruct. So being very successful and very profitable and very wealthy does not necessarily mean you do good clinical dentistry. In fact, there are some very famous names <laughs> then this work I've had to rechange. But having said that, if you did good clinical dentistry, it's more than a bonus, because then others, your colleagues will realize how good you really are. And finally, good peer reviewed credentials. Good peer reviewed credentials. I think if you're on your pathway to proving yourself in this world and you're starting out, is extremely helpful having additional proper qualifications, not by the post fellowships, but real structured peer reviewed education, it all becomes important. But you could make a very good living, a very good life and be a fun, fantastic dentist with any of the above, but I would think that you would prefer to do it with all of the above. And that's really why we have this College of Medicine and Dentistry and Professor uh, Al Mazri is very keen on young people with open innovation, challenging minds. We love to be challenged. We do not teach you like an undergraduate establishment or an undergraduate school, which is now postgraduate uh, produced. We are mostly clinicians. We've been there. We've learned from our mistakes. It's from our hindsight that we have generated our insight. And we will teach you. I mean, the field of occlusion is built on lies about lies about lies about lies. There's hardly any evidence in most of dentistry. Much of the evidence is based on your experiential learning. And of that, we have plenty. And we will challenge you. And we will expect you to challenge us as well. Now, let me challenge you on this. What is this? Is this cosmetic dentistry? Do you think this is cosmetic dentistry? What about this patient? This patient turning out to be this. Is this cosmetic dentistry is my key question. Is this 
what you look at and think, wow, I wish I could do this. Who matters in this world? Who is the person who did this cosmetic dentistry? That is the key question. Whose work are you showing? Because the illusion needs an illusionist to change them out from what it was to what it is. You need someone who is exceptional, who does that work. Is it the dental technician in the work I have shown you? The answer, I'm afraid, is not. It's got nothing to do with the dental technician. It's to do with the IT consultant. That was to do with my son, who is an illustrator and animator. And he works a lot with Photoshop. But I can, I can definitely confirm to you that my work is in Photoshop. My work is real, honest work. They are on analog slides. Beware of international speakers. Mr. Howdy Doody, who come and sell you their beautiful dentists. I can almost guarantee, because I have given lectures right across the world. You name a country, I've been there. And after our lectures, we sit at the bar and we have a drink and we have a natter and we have a laugh. And by and large, I can tell you, you are seeing touched up photographs. Yes, Adobe Photoshop is fantastic. When you finish our course, go and buy this. Maybe you might have to adjust one or two of your work. You see, Photoshop team, how? You know, you have to take a double look to see that they have been photoshopped. The art of this is phenomenal. Beware of lectures on cosmetic dentistry. Yes, the art of deception. What you see is not what you get. So I would say, don't despair about your work. Yours is real dentistry. And if you're honest about your real dentistry, we can make you. We can teach you to make it amazing and exceptional. So what about dentistry and aesthetics? What is beauty? Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. That's Keats, our great poet. Anatole of France said it was more profound than truth itself. Yes? The symmetry of a beautiful face by Stéphane Marcat, of a plastic surgeon. So to get this beauty, most people say, oh, I use the golden ratio. Now, what is this golden ratio? Whatever it is, I can tell you it is the position from which you look at. You can create a golden ratio for anything as long as you're willing to turn your head in any one direction. In fact, the science says it's rubbish. It doesn't affect teeth. It doesn't apply to teeth. So a lot of the stuff that you go back on, and you look at and you were taught, people wax lyrical. It's all lies. It's more con after more con. The problem with aesthetics is as a human being, the dentist can see more than three to five million colors. But we don't have the vocabulary to describe it. And some people are better able to translate it than others. Certainly women are known scientifically to be better than men. So my nurse always helps, and luckily for me, in my practice, my technician works. We both work together in the same building. And the responsibility is well passed on to your technician. And I need help in the form of a background support. And if you're looking at a shape for more than five seconds, your, your rods and cones have already tired out, and you get the wrong feedback. So five seconds is the maximum time you have to make a decision on a shape. Otherwise, you've got to go away and come back again. And shape taking is extraordinary. It's all about lighting conditions. Now, the lighting conditions in the UK is different to your lighting conditions in Dubai or in Turkey. Our lights are northern lights. We do not take our, 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 our shape taking in daylight. We need a bluer light source for British patients. So it is different. And remember, your visual acuity is just five seconds. Five seconds and it moves on. And of course, some people are colorblind. You need to check on colorblindness. And of course, you know, a large percentage, 40% of males have some degree of colorblindness. That's why women are better than And after 15 seconds, definitely all your receptors tire. So, and also shade guides, they are rubbish. Let's look at the Vita shade guide. Why is it that the world has Vita shade guide? The reason the Vita shade guide is world and used by all of us is that when I graduate as an undergraduate, 
long before many of you were born, is that they gave all dentists a free Vita Shade Guide. The reason every dentist got a free Vita Shade Guide, because dentists are mean people, we don't want to spend money if we can't, if we can help it. The reason we got a free Vita Shade Guide was because Vita they knew if we prescribe a Vita Shade A2, or A3 or whatever, the technician then had to go and buy the Vita porcelains. Brilliant, wasn't it? Brilliant. Yes? Manufacture a car, give the car free, but let it run on a particular type of petrol, which nobody else has. You made your fortune. And the Vita Shade Guide is rubbish because the way it is arranged, A1, A2, A3, A4, is nothing to do with teeth. Teeth are about value. That's why composites are so brilliant. Composites are metameric. Metameric means they can disappear into the mouth. That's why acrylic dentures look fantastic, even if you get the shade wrong. You have five shades for acrylic dentures. They all look good in anybody's mouth. Porcelains, you have to really work hard because they are not metameric. You have to build them in. All because their values are not as phenomenal as acrylics. So composites, greatest success is because it's made of acrylic, methyl methacrylate. Yes, bis GMA, bisphenol A, glycidyl methacrylate, UDMA, divoclar product, urethane dimethacrylate, even adhesives, 4 meta, methacryloxy, ethyl, trimelinate, and hydrate. Everything is a methyl methacrylate with a bit of epoxy resin, a whole lot of fillers thrown in to reduce the shrinkage, and voila, you have a material that blends in the mouth. The only reason it looks bad is because you don't know how to use it, and we will teach you how to use it. There are small secrets that make big differences. You don't have to spend more than 10 minutes to make a beautiful, aesthetic, posterior composite I mean, the preparation takes time, the addition takes time, the first layer takes time, but the aesthetic finish, we don't use burrs at all. Teach you how to do it. Looks like a million dollars. Nobody will even know that these are composite teeth. And they are great because they are metamorphic, they disappear to the mouth. Most of the time, dentists get it wrong because they don't know how to make it disappear into the mouth. Because these materials want to disappear into the mouth. So if you have a Vita shade guide, please rearrange your shades. You'll find that so much easier. Start with the B1 first, because this is on value basis. You'll find your shade taking improves so many percent. And now you'll find the modern Vita shade guides and all, all based on values. Hmm? But in any case, what is aesthetic? I mean, the Mayans thought this was aesthetic. In this century, I mean, I've lectured in Kazakhstan and other countries, and dentists have shown me some of the some of the teeth of some of their some of their local communities, their local tribes people. And for them, doing getting teeth like this is aesthetic, not our concept of aesthetic. Concept of aesthetics is unique to that individual, to that culture, to their upbringing, to that nation, amongst lots of other things. So this is that plastic surgeon's patient. Is she beautiful? Is she beautiful? Or is she beautiful? It's the same patient, same with all I've done is elongated. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So by and large, if you can speak to the coconut of the patient, if the patient is convinced about you, a lot of your aesthetic dentists will become so much more easy. But if you have a patient who has personality problems, who really look like the back end of a horse, yes, who are trouble or waiting for trouble, you ain't going to get it right. These people with body dysmorphic disorders, amongst other things, will always be a cause of problem. It's a mental problem. You really don't want to practice mental for our patients. You know, there are seven and a half billion people out there, more than enough for each and every one of us. In the UK, we are crying for dentists. We don't have enough dentists to fix cases. Huh? Remember, you don't have to treat everyone because there is always somebody out there who wants to treat everyone. Let them treat. You don't be afraid. Let's show you some other bits. It'll dovetail into the lectures of my two other colleagues or three other colleagues. Yes, of today.
So this is a patient who came in to see me and he was getting on a bit in age, but he was being honored by Her Majesty the Queen, just as I have. Um, I'm grateful for that. And he was going to give a speech on a very important occasion. And of course, patients like this, very easy. It's a 15 minute makeover. You don't use a blow on these patients. You use a scalpel, you use your composites, any shade, the shades you never use on real composite cases because you're going to do a trial composite run on this patient. So you just pop on a bit of composite. Yes, you pat it in with the back end of a scalpel. You get the nurse to zap it for five seconds, two seconds, one second, and then you shave it with your scalpel blade and you just keep adding it. You just keep adding it and you shave it off. No acid edge. You just flick it on on the teeth and you tell the patient, is this what you want to look like? Yes, that's on the first visit. You've had your consultation, you've done your exam, or the whole lot, and then for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you just walk it. Because you know you can whip it off if the patient didn't like it. And you ask the patient, and you tell, take, take it home and try it out. Take it home and try it out. And the patient takes it home and tries it out. And usually nobody ever notices. Because people at home, which is their family, love the people who are in their family. They don't notice little things like this. Usually when I do a full mouth reconstruction and my practice was based on the foundation of full mouth reconstructions, I ask a patient after I've cemented it in provisionally, what did your family think? If a patient said they thought it was wonderful, I'll take it off and do it again. Because reconstructions, aesthetic dentistry should never be noticeable. If it is noticeable, there is something to be noticed. It is different. So patient goes back, nobody's noticed it. What happens? Within 24 hours, 48 hours, three days, it all starts falling off. Bits fracture off. That's when you make your say. When bits fracture off, it looks so horrendous, the whole family realizes how terrible the teeth were. Yeah? When it falls out, that is when the difference is noticed. But what have you forgotten here? What has been forgotten here? I've done the anterior, I've got the aesthetics, I know what I'm going to do, but what have I forgotten? Yes? Well, they take you to a litigation court. So I was an expert witness in several cases. I served on the General Defense Council, I served on disciplinary committees, all kinds of stuff. Yes, I worked for the Lord Chancellor you know, for about 18 odd years. Uh, being one of the three, three wise men to help appoint judges and magistrates. Yes. So litigation and the law is part and parcel of what I know. And hence, that's what I will finish on at the end of this lecture as to what you need to watch out for. So this was a case. A patient was sent to me because the patient was unhappy with her teeth. When I asked her, what is it that makes? So the lawyer sent it. So I asked her, what is it that you're unhappy with the teeth? Is it the appearance? No, no, it's much better than my previous teeth. Is it the color? No, no, it's much, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong. I don't know what is wrong. And of course, if you've just heard my good friend and colleague, Professor Ziad's lecture, you realize what it was. The anterior guidance was changed on that patient. The patient's teeth are not just about occlusion. It's also about disclusion. The anterior guidance was missing. So this is my car. And in fact, it looking very pretty outside my house is does not matter as much as how it functions. Looking pretty alone isn't enough. Because if it doesn't function well, you'll be having some people to tow your car away. Yeah? You need both estate and function. And in occlusion, it's function and dysfunction. It's occlusion and disclusion. Occlusion is the bringing of teeth together. That's done on verticillators. Disclusion is what's done on articulators. It is taking that, and you may not understand the significance of it, because a lot of occlusion is built on lies. We will explain to you and teach you why these things matter and whether there is any science behind it. I can tell you there isn't much science behind it, but practically speaking and legally speaking, it helps a huge amount. So it's a bit like this. You know, a mandible is like a three-legged stool. When you put an anterior deprogrammer, yes, 
it moves like a three-legged stool, and that's how you find centrifugation. Centrifugation is a bad position. It's an artificial position. You don't want it, but you want to relate to it. And when you close, it's like moving the three-legged stool back to its original position. So that's the concept that most people don't understand, including academics. And we will teach you to understand it, because once you do that, you find life different. And once you understand where disclusion is, you want to capture it. The most important part of an articulator is its incisal guidance table. So here's one of my patients where the disclusion has been captured on a incisal guidance table with Duralay, as explained by Professor Zian. Yeah. Posterior stability and anterior guidance as the story of occlusion and disclusion. Mustn't forget it. It is so important. Manufacturers have pre planned this as well as mechanical orthodontal tables. So, this is KOs. So, I actually was with Walter Lang when he was inventing the Digma. And I contributed to some of the thinking behind it. It's a four dimensional face bore record. It's totally different from an arbitrary face bore. We have one at the College of Medicine and Dentistry, Digma 2. I had the Digma 1 because, of course, I was part and parcel of the original original bit of, uh, uh, let's say, understanding of it. So this, of course, is the traditional anterior guidance table, whereby you put in a bit of a clip, and then you move it around, capturing the anterior guidance. And then when you do your final work, you copy the anterior guidance back in reverse on the palatal surfaces of the anterior teeth. Because, of course, the patient wasn't susceptible when the patient came. The patient had no occlusal problems. The fact that you allowed the technician to build the disclusion with no prescription meant now the disclusion was an interference for the patient. And the patient was never happy. Now, cable, for example, this is a table, that's the incisal table on which you do this. See? And it's a reusable table because you can flick it out afterwards. After you've done it, as long as you've vaseline it, you can flick it out, and then each time the patient comes back, you will slip it back on and reuse it. But there's a screw at the bottom. The screw base at the bottom actually has, at the base of it, an arbitrary anterior guidance table. And in fact, if you ask cable, they'll give it to you at different angles. They'll give you the screw at different angles, so that if a patient did have anterior guidance, anterior disclusion, if you were going into the provisional phase, remember what Ziad said, Prof. Ziad said, yes, it is not a temporary phase, provisional. Provisional means you're learning from it. We don't do temporary crowns here. We do provisional. We want to learn shape, color, Aesthetics, function, dysfunction. So we place this. So to, if you had nothing to start from, without having to find a kinematic face bore, like the digma, you can start with the arbitrary anterior guidance, yes, for that patient, and build on it. And in fact, this is Cable's own, the Protar's own inside the guidance table, where you can actually change the angles without needing this, so you can have it at any number of degrees and this is dina which i also have yes i've had the dina pantograph the pantronic the samaxiograph the digma the lot yes where you can change the anterior guidance and you can also create long center you can also create long center yeah so manufacturers know dentists don't know no point buying all this stuff if you don't know how to use it because the condylar guidance is actually an interference it's an interference you need to know face bows are bad for smile line analysis, face bows are contraindicated for aesthetic dentistry. You need to understand it. We will teach you those things. And in fact, here you are. I will show you. Now, here you are. You've got anterior distinction. But look at if a patient has reduced condylar guidance. Yes, when the patient has reduced condylar guidance, reduced anterior guidance, ends up with posterior interference. So you need to know what this is in relation to this before you can undertake the treatment on this patient. So I come to a different case, severe tooth surface loss, you know, uh, a youth spent misuse, with misuse drugs and all kinds of things. And that's what she was in her teens. And very soon she went around like this. And we, are, of course, going to be constructors somewhere along the line. And those are the teeth. And what I do when I have time at lunchtime is, you know, all these old composites that you have, you have, which has expired. Everybody has expired composites, don't they? Yes. I mean, when manufacturers sell you a box of composites, you have you have shades that you will never use even on a monkey. 
And of course, they've all expired. What do you do with them? You can't send them to the third world. They've all expired. So what people like me tend to do, because I know composites are metameric, yes, have a chameleon effect, is that I use these and I do my own diagnostic vaccine. So I sit there, and usually it's my nurse who sits next to me, and she's with the zap, she goes, two seconds, zap, two seconds, and it's all done with a scalpel, just like in that other patient, in the mouth, yes? And then what you do is you make a quick pull-down template, you don't even have to make past the models, you do a quick pull-down template, and when you show this to the patient, put your thumb over it. If you put your thumb over it, the shadow will make all these colors blend together. So remember, this patient has two purpose loss, which is very severe. I built it up with composites, just scalpel blade and all composite expired stock. Yes, because that's not going into the patient's mouth. Yeah. And then when I show it, I show my thumb over and the patient says, oh, that looks all right. That looks all right. Looks like my hmm? And then I make a pull down template. Yes, a suck down template on that itself because I don't need to make a plaster cast and then I fill it full of composite stick it over the patient's teeth no acid edge use a scalpel to just trim off the excess couldn't care less what the margins were like tell the patient to go home just take it home it fall out but when it falls out the impact is so dramatic because say what's happened to your teeth what's happened to your teeth yep they'll want it fixed tell you they want it fixed of course on that first day i also made an arbitrary mock-up and so when the patient comes back i'm going to do it provisionally because i'm going to do fixed fixed work on, on the patient yes i i know my from my colleague who started off professor meta was extremely gentle kind and so on uh, but i'm on the last train home with the patients in their last stage of life can't faff around they can't go into care homes and end up keep coming back to see me. So I'm cut and thrust. I'm cut and thrust. But I go through the intermediary phase, the intermediary phase of plastic restorations from which I learn and then I replace it. Yes. So here you are. So this is my quick, quick fix. Doesn't take much time. I use a silicone index. And what do I do? What do I do? I build up this. I build up this. Lamella. Lamella built up. Lamella it takes no time at all. Five minutes or two, max. Then, palatally, I don't use composite. Composite is a nasty material. It's lovely aesthetically on that day. It hydrolyzes, it, it breaks down. It's also a petrochemical product, which makes it a known carcinogen. That's why it kills pulps. Don't put it near pulps. But nevertheless, it's very pretty on the day you put it in. But it's also made of sandpaper. Composite is resin and filler. Filler is sandpaper. What's the sandpaper you use to sand your walls, to sand your car, to sand your shelves? Same stuff as composite. Resin, filler, resin and sand, resin and sand. This is man-made sand and resin. So composites, so therefore in patients who are clenching perfunctionists, composites are bad material to even build up teeth because it beats the living daylights out of the opposing teeth. So I'm putting composite, put it against composite. But most people parafunction, so it's not a problem. Parafunction is universal. Pullinger, Seligman and Pullinger produced that paper back in the 1990s. And Pullinger and I have lectured together across the world. And as he says, it's common. It's parafunction is natural. It's a good thing. It's a stress relief. Much rather parafunction than kill your partner. It's when you clench and parafunction, it becomes different. That's a different kind of occlusion, a different kind of reconstruction. And you need to come to us for us to teach you how to undertake clenching parafunctions. In the meantime, in ordinary parafunctions, because everybody parafunctions, you don't want to put composite on the palatal surfaces of discluding teeth. Because discluding teeth protect occlusion. Occlusion protects disclusion. Back protects the front. Front protects the back. Disclusion protects occlusion. Bang, bang. So if you're going to have disclusion, you don't want it to start wearing the opposing tooth. So we use something softer, a bisacry, which can bond to composite, or a compamer. So we place on compamers for the palate, and then we let the patient go home and function on it. We just need it with the patient. So now we wait and wait and wait. If it keeps falling off, we know we haven't got the occlusion right. We haven't got the disclusion right. So we go and make some adjustments. I'll show you lots of cases for white centric, long centric. Yes, the really complex ones. Yeah. So we allow the patient to work it out by themselves on their own time. 
into the war time. And once they have now created their distinction, everything is good, we then take study cards of our temporary work and we construct the anterior cards. Now we can go back and copy the final chronum which work to this. So remember, don't forget disclusion when you do aesthetic dentistry. But that's not what lecture is still about. It is part, it's the middle way. So I'm telling you, aesthetic dentistry, if you're going to go down that route, and that is what you have marketed yourself as, don't forget function and dysfunction. Being pretty alone isn't enough. The patient must not come back and sue you for something nobody understands. And what else have you forgotten? My good friend and colleague, Professor Ziad, hasn't forgotten. It's primitive. All teeth. Will have primitus. Why do you have primitus? Primitus you have, you have primitus. So that is when you put your finger on your tooth and you bite together. All of you, if you put your finger on your tooth and bite hard together, go tap, 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 tap on your posterior teeth, you'll find your front teeth move. And the reason for that is because of not just differential mobility, but adaptive mobility of the teeth. Teeth can be intruded by almost 60 microns. So you have three, four, five, six shim stops worth of movement. You can have that much movement of the lower teeth hitting the upper teeth. And that's why for veneers, on patients who are parafunctionists, who have moving teeth and everybody's teeth move, they move between 20 to 60 to 80 microns in three dimensions. Imagine, just think about it. Veneers are stuck on the front of the teeth. Why do they fall off? They're not in occlusion. They're not in disclusion. The reason they fall out is because of the judder on them. The gather on them, the frimitus on them. When the frimitus hits, the veneers are stuck on with only micro mechanical retention, tiny bits of retention on the retipex. And usually you're putting veneers on some other dentist, stupid veneers, where he's removed all the enamel. Only enamel has the retipex. Dentine does not have it. There is no dentine retention. When you come to adhesive dentistry, you realize dentine has no bonding. Dentine bonding is a fudge. And a lot of the many generations of bonding agents are there to reduce your time and effort. And it's very good for most patients because most patients are okay. It's like parafunction. Everybody parafunctions. It's like plaque. Gingivitis is common to everybody. It's not a big threat. Periodontitis is totally different disease to gingivitis. Totally different. It may not even be due to plaque. That's a different lecture for another day. So like that, same again with primitives. If you don't have enough enamel, you don't have micromechanical retention. You have linear with popping off. So that's why you overlap it palatally. So you end up with macromechanical retention. To get micromechanical retention, the composite must shrink to lock against the reti base. That's the retention. The retention is mechanical. It shrinks and locks. It locks into the tiny enamel reti pegs. That's why you don't etch for more than 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds maximum. Because if you over itch, you've left too many dead spaces and then the bad color gets in from your coffee and tea and it looks terrible. So you etch sharp, etch flash, bond quick. But of course, if you don't have any enamel, you can't rely on dentin, dentin is rubbish. It doesn't stick. The whole idea is to not allow it to push the composite out. That's why you have wet bonding. And because dentists don't know how much wet is wet, they incorporate the wetness into their hydrophilic monomers. Yeah? It's all very clever stuff. They have to try and make their product sell. That's why you wrap it over. Once you wrap it over, there's micromechanical retention of the enamel retipex locking, but there's macromechanical retention of the entire composite locking. The entire adhesive locks on itself. And that's the reason why you left all the incisive. Huh? See? Free, free lectures. Come and learn the real things. So, but really, at the end of the day, go and find the best technician you can't afford. And you create a career with that. I was very lucky. My technician came from the Lebanon, Nadim Kurban. He was Peter K. Thomas's own technician. And most of the work, if not all the work I show you, will be Nadim's. I just take them out. 
Mm -hmm. So as a dentist with a team on soil, you need the right information regarding the soil. Good study cuts, gingival tissue control, sound tooth preparation will teach you to cut like gods. That's if you come to the crown of this. Of course, Shami will teach you the adhesive part of it. That would be brilliant. This is brilliant. Yes? And, 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 and Ziad, we all know, is already brilliant. Yes? And of course, the functional pres uh, prescription of methodology with Ziad as well. Yes, diagnostic provisional, see, no temporaries, share side characterizations, pace and part location means we talk to the coconut of the patient, correct selection of materials based correctly, and we teach you about all the different materials, why some are rubbish, some are not. But we have to use rubbish in some circumstances, whether we like it or not. It depends on who that patient is. We you know what the problem is, it's who the patient is. Now, who the patient is far more important than what is the problem. And you need an excellent patient, but that's still not enough. That I'm afraid is still not enough. So what's missing? This is the paradigm shift. The world has changed, certainly in the West. It's a major change in how people think and get things. Yes? We can't sell origami when patients expect a swan. Hmm? The game is changed. I should know. I was at the forefront of seeing all these changes happen, thinking, Oh, by the grace of God, go I. I could have been there. I could have been there. Aren't I lucky? Hmm? So, really, silence does not equal consent. Consent in the Western world has to be informed and understood. But that's not all now. I mean, we know that. But it's more complex than that. Yes? You see, the legal framework has completely changed because there is new law coming in. It's all about previous case law. And the case law is changing rapidly all the time. I'll bring you up to date. And this is Paul Tipton, a very fine dentist, who said dentists are seen as easy pickings by the public and citizens. And there's been a phenomenal rise of dental negligence cases. So much more litigation. A lot of the time you look at it and you think, gosh, it's not that bad. Yet, it's not very defensible. We've got to pay up. And once you start paying up, defense societies will charge you more for your indemnity insurance. And it's a mandatory requirement in the United Kingdom and many of the Western countries to have uh, indemnity insurance. And, and sometimes it can go into 30, 40,000 pounds a year for people who have not perhaps because they have intentionally made a mistake, but have made a mistake that they maybe shouldn't have. The old test, the Bolam test of 1957, that was due to a person who needed to have shock therapy because he was mentally unstable. And the doctor who gave the patient shock therapy did not tie the patient down on the, on the, on, 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 on the chair before the shock therapy was given. So when the shock therapy was given, the patient flew off the chair, hit the floor, broke the hips, sued the doctor. Case went to court. Court said, ha, 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 ha. Doctors are always right. Just because some doctors might tie you in, it doesn't mean every doctor has to tie you in because some doctors don't tie their patients. It's your fault for jumping off the chair and breaking your hip. I'm afraid that era is gone, finished, over. We got a shock when the next era came, which was the Hudson Court in the Court of Appeal. And there it was said the courts must be vigilant to see whether the reasons given for Putting a patient at risk are valid in the light of any well-known advancing medical knowledge or whether they stem from a residual adherence to out of date ideas. In other words, if you felt you didn't have to tie a patient in, when the knowledge said you did have to, then I'm afraid you're stuffed. And it took almost 10 years. Nobody did this. But that took a month. But that's not all. The Belito case came. And the Belito case came and said, excuse me. There may be a body of opinion which is saying this. There may be another body of opinion saying this. And both bodies of opinion, one from the Royal College of Surgeons of England, one from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, well, the Royal Colleges of Surgeons, are they from England and Edinburgh? I mean, I was a dean at the Royal College of Surgeons of England at one time. Yes? Who is right? Of course, I would say I'm right because I'm from England. Edinburgh would say they are right. And the judge said, oh, 
the body of opinion must also be shown to be reasonable. And who decides that is the question. And the decision is made by the man on the Clapham omnibus. It's not made by the profession. We take professional views. I'm sitting from the Lord Chancellor's chair, the judge's chair. We take the views, but the decision is mine. Or oh, it's the decision of my jury. They must think which opinion was better. Whoops. But it's moved on even further than that. Huh? This is James Garner and Doris Day. You won't even remember them. They're probably dead before you were born. Huh? These were in my time. Move on, darling. It's a lovely movie. Hmm? The Montgomery 2015. It was all about medical attorneys. In other words, it said doctors really cannot talk down to patients. Patients are autonomous. They have freedoms of independence, of choice. They should decide for themselves with all the information provided. So this was against the Lanarkshire Health Code. And what it actually said was, patients must make the decision. A reasonable person, a patient is considered a reasonable person. A reasonable person in the patient's position would be likely to attach a significance to the risk or the doctor is or should be reasonably aware that the patient would be likely to attach significance to it. So you need to tell them almost all the risks that a patient might consider significant. So now you can't turn around and say your tooth might die because I'm using a composite. Uh, you, 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 I mean, nowadays you can't turn around and not say your tooth might die because I'm using a composite. You will say that because composites are petrochemical products. They are known mutagens, they are known carcinogens. That's why more bacteria grow next to composites than they do against amalgam. Amalgam is micromercurial poisoning. Amalgam is not adhesive. There's always a gap between amalgam and the tooth. But amalgams leak a lot less than a composite. Why? Because no respecting bacteria is going to grow up their children under a micromercurial toxic time bomb. But they love composites. Because composites are petrochemical products, and that's how evolution takes place. You have a mutagen, your children are going to have three heads and five hands. Isn't it wonderful? Far more attractive kids. So that's why most composites, once they start fracturing off the vision, are something where bacteria love to be. Yeah? So you should be able to turn around and say, these are actually toxic to the pulp as well. And when you come, we teach you about the pulp, how the pulp defends itself despite you, despite you. And why it is you use an air rotor and not an electric micromotor to cut teeth. That's interesting too. Why buy an air rotor when you can buy a cheaper micromotor? Going just as fast, but you don't cut teeth. Again. Wow. Then the Muller case, the last I will show you. There are others in the pipeline. And this is against King's College Hospital NHS Foundation. Where they turned around and said, you can't take an overview like that. You have to break it into. You have to take it as a diagnostic question. First, you must find out whether it was wrong at the top. Then you have to decide whether it was wrong at the bottom. Double jeopardy. So the first type is when a patient's condition is unknown and the diagnosis is right or wrong. If wrong, is it negligently so or not? This was to do with, with, with some uh, histological work that was done. The second type is of pure treatment, where the nature of the patient's condition is known and the alleged negligence consists of a decision to treat or advise treatment of the condition in a particular way. In other words, a two-step process. So whether a medical practitioner acted in accordance with the practice accepted as proper and ordinary competent medical practitioner by a responsible body of medical opinion, which is decided by an individual who is not a medical person, and whether the practice survives bulletin, judicial scrutiny of being reasonably responsible. That's a change in life, isn't it? So I'll show you a case. This is not mine. I picked it out of the internet. And I show it to my students. And this patient came for aesthetic treatment. I did. Yes? And I showed the work that was done. And it really does look nice. I mean, no incendiary. Yes? I mean, there's a bit of gingival information. And one of the reasons you have gingival information is if you're using adhesive dentistry, the adhesive leaches out from behind your room. That leaching out from behind your veneer hits the gingiva. Some patients' gingiva are more sensitive than other patients' gingiva. And that's why you have persistent inflammation after you've cemented adhesive dentistry. Adhesive dentistry, if you're going to cement anything with adhesive dentistry, 
make sure you put a barrier on the ginger so that if it's a retraction cord, which is very likely placed, that picks up all the adhesive and you whip it up. Make sure you polish the margins well from the adhesive. Because as long as the adhesive is there, you can't see the adhesive. It doesn't stick to the dentin. So because it is gingival and it is root surface and it is cementum, it can't bond to the cementum, but it overlays the cementum with small adhesive bits, a bit like bit like bit like velcro. And inside these velcro bits will be the bugs. They can grow there. And the velcro itself is an inflammatory material. Composites are inflammatory. Yes? Next time you have a cut on your finger, put a bit of composite on it. Cuts like mac. Nasty product. Composites are high allergens. They go through gloves to produce the allergy. So you want to make sure that the gingiva is well protected whenever you use adhesive techniques. Because if the material gets underneath there, it's a big problem. Because the gingiva can't heal very well. Hmm? Now, I showed you the before, I showed you the after, and I said they were love. My students all think they're love. Now let's show you the intermediates. The one in the middle. Now what do you if you showed that to the patient or the patient's family, would they have approved of this? When really, your colleagues would have turned around and said, why don't you just add a bit of composite? Pop the inside them and send them to Wyman Chan. Get Wyman to get the teeth white. Our Professor Chan is a miracle man. And you just had a bit of composite. Send it to Professor Shamir. Done. You don't even have to send him to Professor Ziad because, of course, you haven't changed the palatal uh, occlusion at all. Yeah? Now, what do you think? Now, this is a potentially serious litigation case. You can turn around and say, oh, I don't have this class. I don't know. You need to. Baseline records are compulsory, are mandatory. If you Another person might think it's how you needed to have had the evidence to show that you had. In the absence of it, well, whose word is going to be taken? Here is Martin Kelleher, an old adversary of mine, just retired from King's, one of the finest pairs of hands in industry, one of the most brilliant speakers. If ever he can, if you, if you ever come across lecturing, uh, him lecturing, please go and listen to him. Outrageously funny marvelously practical and shows superb work and he said and this is in the journal published by the royal college of surgeons of england which is very close to my heart that's the faculty of dental uh, surgeries journal he said the blatant destruction of teeth apparently are being undertaken to cure patients affected by porcelain deficiency disease i mean what a powerful statement why are you removing sound good enamel, Raj? He said. Do your patients suffer from porcelain deficiency disease? Why do you want to replace good enamel with porcelain? Is that a disease? He went on to say this is a newish disease, identified by some dentists who also uh, seem to think that teeth suffer from hyper enamelosis, an excess of enamel. <laughs> it's a new term coined by you. Hyper enamelous versus and porcelain deficiency disease. He wanted to say this probably goes without saying that both of these conditions are imaginary, fictitious. Yet it appears to me at times that they are perceived to exist by some cosmetic dentists. Now he sits on the board of our largest uh, indemnity society, dental protection. Unit. Double mugging of these patients. These unfortunate patients are being robbed twice. First of their money and again of their enamel and dentine. So if you are coming to Britain to work, take heed of what I am saying. And we will teach you that. You may turn around and say, but the patient insisted. The patient wanted it. The patient swore they will not sue. He is a patient, he is a fictitious patient who came and said, My daughter is getting married to a prince in 10 days' time. Can I have great teeth for the wedding? So you look inside the mouth. And this is what you see. You say, oh, no. She says, no, no, I don't want dentures. It's 10 days. Just put bridges in there. I know they will fail. I lose my teeth. I will sign any indemnity. And she signs. I know my teeth will fall out. 
I've insisted that you undertake the Crown and Bridge work. I am happy to pay for it. Here is the money up front. Please do the work. I will absolve you from any litigation. Witness signed, sealed, handed over. Doesn't work. And doesn't work. Patients cannot write away their rights. It's a bit like buying something from John Lewis, one of the best department stores here. And they say, I'm afraid we can't give you a guarantee on this because it is something in the showroom. I'm afraid if it fails within one year, you still have the guarantee. You cannot sign away the guarantee. If you're asked by a patient to undertake treatment that you believe is unnecessary, you must act with the patient because only the patient doesn't know, only you know. Only you know. And the patient will come back and say, my bridges have fell not. It's only lasted three weeks. But he said, I did tell you it won't last. Ha, 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 ha. What do you mean? Hmm? You signed an indemnity. That's not worth it because I didn't know all the uh, reasons. Yeah? Do not undertake treatment that will cause permanent damage to your body, dentition, or will be of no clinical or cosmetic benefit. This is after work from people like Professor Aubrey Shyam, uh, Professor Richard Elderton, and all of the others. They turned around and said, People who didn't go to see a dentist regularly ended up with more teeth than people who went to see a dentist regularly. We were the harmful people for patients. If the treatment fails, the patient may seek damages. And finally, a signed statement from the patient instructing you to carry out the treatment and absolving you from any of the state, stated adverse consequences may not provide a valid defense in the court or before the general dental council. So times have changed. You will need to practice defensive practice. And defensive dentist is not a bad thing. It is not against the patient. It is to protect your reputation. And if you are a student of our quality of medicine dentistry, our reputation, because our reputation will lie in your hands. And therefore, we have an interest in you, and you must have an interest in us. Hmm? The world Certainly in the West has changed. It has become far more litigious. And I would tell you without any hesitation that you will need to think when you put yourself out as a cosmetic dentist of all the consequences, not just aesthetics, not just function, but also how it will stand up to school. So therein lies not one paradigm shift but several when it comes to the care of a fellow human being. I hope it's been food for thought. I'm allowed to be outrageous, but I'm not. It is what it is. Well, I hope I get to see some of you at least at the college at some point in time. And I hope you've had a very good conference. Thank you very much for having listened to it. Thank you very much, Raj. That was as entertaining and enlightening as always. I always really enjoy hearing you speak, I have to say. Has anybody got any questions for Raj that they could put in the chat box? Questions for Raj, anybody before we let him go? Well, all it leaves me to say is thank you, all guys, and I hope you have a wonderful, great, and superb career. Thank you very much, Raj. No doubt I'll see you soon. Cheers. So, thank you everyone for today. I think it's been a really informative and excellent day. I've really enjoyed it myself personally. If you do want any more information, obviously you can contact the Knightsbridge Academy at info at kbac.uk. Um, for any information on the courses from the College of Medicine and Dentistry, it's a similar email address, so info at comd.org.uk. So if there's any, any questions or any further questions from that, just email either of the email addresses and we'll be able to assist you and get them answered for you. I think that's it from us. Um, is there anything that you want to say, Mulan, before we sign off? No, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for your effort, for your brief um, introduction. Uh, see you next time.
see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for all Thank <laughs> you.